Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back after the lunch. So since yesterday, we've been having brainstorming sessions. And uh, today was indeed a red letter day in the history of SDT University when we had a vice chancellor's conclave and we had five vice chancellors speaking on one topic that was indeed worth appreciating. Then we had our second session on Gandhi's concept of education, philosophy, and religious ideas. And now here we are with the third session of the day, scientific innovation and national education policy. So for this session, may I invite the chair and the speakers on the dais, please. Uh, I request Dr. Bakulesh Kumar, Executive Director, Cadilla Pharmaceuticals, who is going to chair the session to kindly grace the dais, please. We welcome you, sir. And may I invite our learned speaker, Professor Unnat Pandit, Controller General Patents, Designs and Trademarks, Government of India. <laughs> Sir has made it all the way from Mumbai to grace the occasion and has been kind enough to accept the invitation. We welcome you, sir. Then we have Professor Rakesh Pandey from the University of Delhi. <laughs> Dr. Parikshit Manhas from the University of Jammu. And Sri Sopan Joshi, author and environmentalist. May I request Madam Sandhya Vasudevan to kindly be the moderator for this scientific session. Thank you. And may I please request Sri Rajneesh Vagva to welcome and introduce the dignitaries. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sri Rajneesh Vagva, Dean External Affairs, SGT University. Thank you, Radhika. Um, it's my proud privilege to uh, welcome this galaxy of uh, eminent uh, personalities here. Um, while most of them need no introduction, but still, you know, we'll. Uh, do the ceremonial bit. Uh, I've been asked by Amog to keep it very short and sweet. Um, so because, you know, we have uh, two people to catch the flights, uh, Dr. Pandit and uh, Sandhya. Uh, so we'll uh, quickly go through the bit. Uh, Dr. Bakulesh Kamar, Executive Director at Cadilla Pharmaceuticals. We know him as the Sepsivac man, you know, who actually repurposed the drug today, which has uh, saved lives of millions not only in this country, but it got an FDA approval from Philippines as well as the primary drug to control uh, COVID-19. So, um, you know, a loud applause for Dr. Kamar. <laughs> we have Professor Unnat Pandit, um, the Controller General for Patents, Trademarks and Design. Uh, this is only the most recent uh, innings, uh, but will be a very, very long and meaningful innings, you know, for the country. Um, I think he's pushing the fervor for patents and trademarks and designs in the right set of direction. Uh, in addition to this, you know, he played a very pivotal role at the uh, Niti Aayog. He was the mission director for Atal Innovation Mission, uh, which actually took the concept of innovation and uh, entrepreneurship to the grassroots levels. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pandit, for gracing the occasion. We have uh, Dr. Rakesh Pandey from Kirodimal College from uh, Delhi University. A uh, hardcore academician at heart who actually personifies the teacher taught relationship, uh, I think, uh, very, very gracefully. Uh, he is known for his uh, Gandhian principles as well. We'll be a little bit delighted to hear from him. We have uh, Professor Parikshit Minhas from University of Jammu, the Udhampur campus. Um, again, somebody who's leading it from the front. Uh, he is the, in addition to several other things, you know, he's the editor member of. Uh, the ICRI. Uh, he's been on the panel for, uh, he's a member with the Taylor University, Malaysia, uh, where, you know, he's uh, guiding them on innovation and it's, he runs a center for entrepreneurship and innovation with them. Thank you, Dr. Minas, for coming. We have uh, Sopan Joshi ji, uh, author, journalist, par excellence. Uh, you know, all his life, you know, in the early 25 years of his career, you know, he's been duly inspired by Gandhi ji his philosophies, his values, which is very eminently depicted in his um, book, which he authored, uh, which is named as Ek Tham Mohan. Uh, 
uh, which is uh, based on the values you know which gandhi ji uh, professed or advocated and which finds too much of relevance in, for the young generation so we'll be delighted to hear you uh, he's done extensive writing and edited and reported work in the space of uh, environment in technology water sanitation forests and uh, it'll be a great perspective to hear from uh, supan uh, sandhya sandhya comes from the banking fraternity the former managing director of the doishe bank in india and i think it's a um, it's a privilege to understand that you know what financial inclusion and the concepts of uh, you know not only financial inclusion but you know the digital inclusion can possibly be taken to the next level so we'll be delighted to um, hear you as well um, so she'll be moderating the session and uh, i'll leave the session uh, in very safe pair of hands and thank you very much thank you thank you Uh, this session will be slightly different from the others. Uh, everyone will speak, give their initial perspectives, and then we'll hopefully have a lively discussion on the stage. It won't be each one just sharing their views on it. But before that, I think uh, Asa Mogra will share a few. No, no, I'm just I'm the official timekeeper. I'm standing here in my capacity <laughs> as for keeping time. That's okay. It. Over to you. Over to you, doctor. Okay. So. What should I do? Introduce the topic? Okay. Every, everybody gets a minute. Yeah. Uh, all of you get a minute okay. to make so your opening remarks. Please. I'll introduce the topic. So patent, as we know now, the patent as we know now was a basically traditional rulers giving rights to those with whom they are happy. That's how it started. But then, uh, as we know, at that point in time, around 1100, 1200, 1300, rulers in the Western world did not have adequate resources. So whenever they used to be happy, they used to give something which they don't own. And that's how the modern patent system came. And in uh, relation to Gandhiji and 75 years Azadi, British uh, company was also patent rights given by Queen Elizabeth. And that's how they came here. So they were given rights to trade exclusively with East of Cape of Good Hope. If they can trade, they can trade exclusively. First right was for 20 years, and then perpetually it went on increasing. I think this is enough for the beginning. <laughs> no, I think I'm going to ask him to share some stories about his experiences. It'll actually blow your mind on how uh, different people, different perspectives, which is where the multidisciplinary approach is going to help in the future. So over to you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> I think so many uh, thoughts have already put in from the dais about Gandhiji and the national education policy. But it is important that we learn why those things have happened during those times. And what was the need? Uh, when we try to learn about Gandhiji, he was the biggest uh, disruptor. He has uh, given a different direction to the freedom movement. And his main goal uh, while giving this direction was to uh, ensure that people are united, people get a, a thought process where they bring certain uh, central line on working together irrespective of any caste, religion, gender or uh, any other means which divide them which was a biggest uh, time frame and biggest change which he brought in and while we are discussing about his uh, thoughts on science, innovation and I'm sure uh, in previous session, Amog might have also shared that uh, about the Charkha design movement. So this was not just the need of, an, of, of time. And he set the benchmark. He wants the 10 times increased production. 
and while he has got a five times he has not uh, awarded the prize money so the thing which we have to learn that we should not compromise on quality and the benchmarking so that is something which is on a highest mode and again we challenge was launched and the prize money was also uh, increased but same thing uh, while designing this challenge he has uh, he has given the directive that it should uh, produce the uh, cotton yarn uh, in a most cost effective manner the design should be uh, irrespective of the uh, hand which which can be worked so lefty people and righty people can also operate this uh, particular uh, device he has also ensure that uh, it should be a lightweight so that uh, women can also carry this and uh, subsequently he has also ensured that it should produce a similar consistency in the quality so all these are a micro uh, design and detailing but still this shows the way i think the disruption was required and without compromising this disruption he has brought in so now i want to correlate this fundamental aspect with the national education policy see national education policy is also one of the disruption in the education sector which needs to have give the offer the vision of producing the quality output and while the quality output is we are trying to produce it should be protected it should be patented patent office has reduce the pri cost of patenting by seven offering a 75% discount so there is no uh, logic that now cost is uh, going high now <coughs> the major challenge which then gandhi ji has also realized and we need to realize his major focus was on offering a better product which society appreciate we are so are we time yeah <laughs> are we designing such solution i think all these questions are going to have a discussion but these are my initial remark we can have the uh, further submission later on in the tradition of government of india you have done forex <laughs> <laughs> so i am uh, supposed to give only the opening remarks okay <clears throat> okay and in a minute i am very sorry but in a minute please okay i i uh, uh, wanted to discuss um, gandhi ji's concepts in education uh, with the national education policy which is the actually the uh, uh, the uh, main theme of uh, the whole uh, conference um, but uh, we we have this idea that gandhi ji's concepts those days were uh, considered to be anti science um, people thought that he is not uh, is not progressive he is conservative okay and which was wrong because he was probably thinking of much ahead of his time when he said that while using the natural resources you should be uh, very conservative then it was basically he was talking about sustainable development which probably he was talking much ahead of his time uh, how do you uh, use your natural resources it should be judicious use of natural resources uh, that is how he he said that there is a difference between industrialization and the handi uh, handicraft movement okay charkha pe jyada dhyan diya uh, handloom industries pe utna dhyan nahi diya kyun kyunki he thought that this would serve the mass in a better way so his idea was to serve the humanity to the mass in a better way to use science to serve the nation to serve the masses i think with this opening remark hmm. thank you thank you uh, very good afternoon to 
all the honorable dignitaries and vice chancellors sitting off the dais, honorable dignitaries on the dais. Uh, well, a couple of things that I would like to talk about or what my focus has primarily been on is uh, after reading some, some ideas about national education policy and the way Gandhiji has been talking about his education and the way he led up such a strong movement in our country, what to do about innovation and how things move. See, a couple of things if we look towards Gandhiji's life, which youngsters should know about and which youngsters should think about is, we all are very active in the present. We always keep looking at things, we try to do one thing or the other. Some of us are very, very reactive. When a situation happens, we react to that. And we try to develop things. But if we look at what Gandhiji's concept was and what he was thinking and how things were working, he was proactive. He always used to envisage what's going to happen in future. What are the things that need to be looked at? And that's what our national education policy is working towards. And that's what young innovators, the disruptors, as uh, Unnatji was referring towards, have to work on, look at. Be proactive. We don't want active or reactive people. We want proactive people. Pro proactive youngsters who can envisage where we want to take India in years to come. What do we see? What is going to happen in future? Which industries are the best? What are going to be the basic pillars of our economy, of our growth, which can help build our country? I was listening to the Honorable Vice Chancellors during their session and the way they were talking about things that have happened in past and how things have built up over the period of time. So be very proactive, understand, think the way Gandhiji was working on and the way our national education policy has spoken about, maybe till now just on paper. But yes, if we are proactive, we would be able to build it up in a better way and remove or eradicate the most important ill of the society, that's ignorance. If you are proactive, obviously, ignorance is going to go away, and that's what Gandhiji was working mm -hmm. towards. Thank you. Good afternoon. Some of the biggest tech companies around us today, the ones who have, that have profited the most from intellectual property and from patents, and innovation that's governed by the intellectual property regime, it's well worth our while to look at their legal budgets, which run into billions of dollars, thousands of billions of dollars. These are companies that defend their intellectual property. They say that it is based on a, on a code of honor, but they're constantly fighting among themselves because they're violating each other's intellectual property. And I'll wind up my one minute by just reminding you of a few quotes from pop culture. Creativity is remembering what you heard, but forgetting the source. <laughs> Originality is forgetting the source. And you know, quotes like, uh, great, uh, great artists, a good artist borrow, great artists steal. So yeah, just focus on theft a little bit. <laughs> so I'm, that's my one minute. That's your copy left approach. No. But well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's where the patent office comes in picture. Patent office makes sure that they don't grant a patent for what is known. And then all the patent granted patents are subject to opposition. If you know that this was a prior art and this was known and this is obvious copy or obvious uh, enhancement of what is known. So if as long as something is known and if you do something which is obvious out of that known, then you don't get a patent. And even if you have got a patent by whatever means, by mistake or by fraudulent ways, it can be challenged and made null and void. And there are enough examples to that effect. So on that note, do you want to share some of the stories behind your patents? OK, so no, before that, I'll, I'll tell you, OK. See, we are talking about education policy. And then uh, we are made to believe that solutions can come from learned people. Okay. By and large, we believe that learned people can give a solution. 
So since he mentioned about the patent and product, I'll give you an example which I've never told you. <laughs> so there is a company, now I can name them also. There is a company called Alcon, which is world renowned number one company for ophthalmic products. And they invest heavily in R&D. So they were trying to develop a product for these end contact lens, which used to have a protein deposits on the lens. So how to keep the lens clean? Because you can't throw it daily, because at that point in time, they were expensive. Disposable had not come. So they were all senior scientists, junior scientists, they were doing a brainstorming session. It went on for two days. And then one senior vice president, he's no more. He goes to washroom. And a janitor is there in front of a washroom, sees a black happy lady, and she says, sir, why you are so disturbed? I have never seen you so disturbed. Usually the meetings are over in three, four hours. This meeting is going on for two days and you are worried. So what is wrong? Then he says, we are trying to find a solution for this problem. And then she says, it's very simple, sir. <coughs> I mean, she said that like, what is it traditionally done in, I mean, Indian part? use the ashes particles to clean utensils. You use the same principle to clean the contact lens. She gave an idea, solution. Then they worked on it and designed a solution which contained a micro particle which does not disturb the contact lens but disturbs only the protein part. And that became a very big product for them. So ideas can come from anybody. So don't negate the idea because it has come from a junior student or a janitor. And this is a real life situation where company benefited and company recognized that janitor. I think going, one of the reasons I volunteered, one, to come to this event, and second, why I wanted to be part of this uh, forum is we have a lot of students here. Um, you're going to learn lots of new things. When you go into the workforce, you're never going to do the job that you got trained for because the world is changing so dramatically. There is a YouTube video, it says, did you know? By the time you finish your college, a lot of stuff which you've learned is obsolete. It's not going to be relevant anymore. So what you are going to learn is from what I think Professor Madan and uh, uh, Professor Singh were saying, the more you're curious, the more you're willing to do multi, uh, multi disciplinary activities, that's what's going to change the way you take things. I volunteered to work with uh, Professor <laughs> that funded. That's how I landed up sitting here. Otherwise, I would not have even stumbled into this world of academia, but for him. Over to you now. Why don't you share some stories? See, <clears throat> one important thing what she has told is to learn uh, with, with open mind and with adopting the knowledge from various disciplines. And uh, that is not just going to uh, improve your knowledge, but certain skill set also need to be improved. And this is more important that while we are trying to improve the skill set, knowingly, unknowingly, we are trying to learn so many things wherein we are going into the uh, identification of a root cause for any such problem. And while identification, we are trying to apply the knowledge. And that's how we will try to, while applying this, we will try to do something new, something differently. And while the, this approach is getting developed, we are doing so many experiments. And sometimes experiments may have a failure, and some good experiments will have a test of a success. And while we are aiming to have a success, what should be the focus? So I correlate with my previous submission that it should have a societal relevance. And I would also like to correlate it with uh, Dr. Kamar's idea that any idea, big idea starts with a small baby steps. And that's what is important. We develop this perception. And such perception will make us a different personality which is uh, adaptive to the societal changes and 
which thinks about the changes which is required and that's what something which new education new national education policy is also trying to encourage the research among the academic people among the academicians students and give a different percep perception give them ample opportunity to learn something which they have not yet explored and give the multidisciplinary multilingual approach this is again a, a big disruption in the education sector and you might have also heard that uh, students can also avail to parallel degrees so how this is going to happen this is something which is a big question but yes this disruption has happened i think doctor wants to counter her okay so i mean i don't know much about education policy and education per se but uh, for patent or getting new things into the society most fundamental is you should be aware of making good observation that is a fundamental of science if you make good observation believe that observation cannot be wrong then you can challenge the dogma and the other part of the story the other extreme is you should be aware of the problems because if you don't know the problems you can't find solutions so these are two important parameters by which ipr is generated if you don't make observations you can't use them you can't challenge the dogma and if you don't know the problem you can't find solutions and if you don't find solutions you can't have a patent i'll give you an example which i told you now so which he wanted me to tell so like the janitor when i was a first year resident our lab technician made an observation that these eyes as per conventional teaching given to him by professors are not usable but according to him they were much better than which were being used so he could not go to professors and since i was trying to be friendly with everybody he came to me look at this he used to call me bakavi bakavi ajara june i am saying in the vernacular language aa mane kai barabar na lagta aa lok kai kam nahi vaparta aa vaparva jevi che par vaparta nahi so i said okay let me go to professor i went to the professor they were world renowned for that particular area and done original research they said don't waste your time this is useless don't use it once in a while is okay but then i had a faith in him and my observation so i persisted made those observations consistently documented that and then i was convinced that this observation right whether my professor says or book says or journal says is entirely different is rubbish if the observation is right everything is all right then we went on not only documenting but finding out why this happened and that's where my background knowledge the technician could not do it why this happened but since i had a background knowledge of the subject i could identify the reason is probably this and then see if this is the reason how can i use it to better use that information observation and ultimately over a time it made to a development of a corneal preservative and which i patented and uh, made it open so i mean observations made right and if you know the problem and if you have a background knowledge you can use it to find a solution i'm going to slightly jump the sequence i'm going to ask uh, professor uh, parikshit to talk about uh, the tourism university we were chatting about it in the context of development of the northeast and uh, there was a bit of an idea that's where it came from but he was then sharing uh, how there is no single university for tourism and if you look at it you can't get more multi disciplinary than that area so do you want to share some of your perspective on how you can link it up to nep yeah sure sure uh, thank you uh, well couple of things uh, obviously hello yeah yes so uh, the fact is that we have been talking about so much about uh, upskilling the youngsters of our country and we have been talking about so much that how different industries are going to work and which are the industries which are going to be mainstay for our country and how the economy is going to grow over a period of time and all that stuff lots and lots of debates are going on but everybody is very candid and clear about the fact that tourism is going to be one of but when i talk about tourism i talk about hospitality tourism industry in general and it's going to be one of the mainstays 
Uh, as we already understand, one in 11 people in our country are working or attached directly and indirectly with, it, with this industry. 10% of approximately of our GDP is part of it. And uh, uh, the fact is that we still don't have a, an institution at the highest level, a university or a setup which is actually going to build this thing, this industry in a more robust manner more progressive manner and built it in such a manner that the youngsters or the youth are trained or better equipped for future. Uh, when, when, when I talk about it, I link it with, obviously, we, uh, I had three thoughts in my mind. One was obviously Gandhiji, the second was national education policy, and third was the innovation aspect, that how do we work on it? How do we build it up? And this is one of those industries which can actually benefit out of it. Uh, I've, I've worked on five things or five pillars which I primarily refer towards it, which are referred as A-E-I-O-U, the five vowels that we have. Uh, first of all, one of those industries, Gandhiji's concept was there, national education policy talks about, and the A stands for adaptability. And this is the industry where every youngster, every youth could easily be adapted into, could easily be molded into, could be worked on. And that's a very, very important aspect and which you as youngsters, whenever you're thinking of joining this industry or, or trying to be an innovator, and if you want some teachings or some thoughts to come from Gandhiji, obviously he was the one of the most adaptable person around. And the second AE stands for efficiency. This is the industry which always looks for efficiency at every aspect. You go to a restaurant, you go to the any airlines, you go to a travel agent, you're always looking for a best products because that's your vacation time. And you don't want anything or any hindrance. Even if you're going for a lunch, dinner, or breakfast for a couple of hours, you don't want any hindrances. So efficiency is a core concept. And I don't think so anybody was more efficient in this country than Gandhiji. And the national education policy talks about it. I stands for inclusivity. Gandhiji were, was one of the most inclusive person taking everybody along. Our national education policy talks about it. And my tourism industry is one of those where everybody is employed. Unfortunately, even minors are part of this particular industry. But we take people from our caste, color, creed, and women from people from least developed countries. Everywhere, tourism is one of those things which makes everybody gel along. And a lot of people are working in that. So that's a very, very important aspect which we should look at. And then, obviously, O refers towards opportunities. When you, one in 11 person around the globe, and as well as in your country, are employed within this particular industry, and when we roughly, if we calculate around the globe also, and within the country also, around 10% of the GDP is coming out of this particular industry. So you see that what amount of opportunities exist within this particular industry. Young innovators, youngsters, youth should always look at this and try to follow. And the last one is universalism. Obviously, no one than Gandhiji was the most universal person around, most universally acclaimed person. And that's what my national education policy, our national education policy, wants to make you youngsters as the most universally acceptable youth of the world. And again, the fact is that which better trade than tourism to look at, to work on, to build it up and build around it. So these are some of the things which I had and which I keep referring towards always and I keep talking about. Thank you, Sandhya ji. I'll just add a couple of things. What uh, he hasn't shared much is when we had this conversation of how can we do a few things in the Northeast, he spoke about having set up destination tourism activity in China, in Peru, in uh, Indonesia, I don't remember which countries, but what was fascinating to me was why are we not doing it? I'd love to go to those places. And it requires completely different mindset from how we tackle the problem today. So with that, but we need the foundations correct. That's why I'll ask uh, Professor Rakesh to share his views. OK, <clears throat> when I think, uh, I was thinking on uh, the Gandhi's concepts and the similarities between the Gandhi concept, because national education policy as such doesn't admit that uh, uh, anything is being taken from Gandhi's ideas. But if you, if you read Gandhi and if you read national education policy, you would see so many similarities. It would 
mm, make you believe that almost everything has been uh, extracted from there. Uh, but one, one similarity that I would like to point it out over here that both the Gandhi's ideas and the national education policy both have, both feel proud of their past. That we had an education system in place. Gandhiji uh, comment, I mean, we have been uh, talking about that. He said that we had a beautiful tree of education and it was cut. Uh, down by uh, the British. And uh, the national education policy also talks about the uh, tradition of uh, universities, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Nalanda University, Takshila University, that the tradition that we had. So uh, national education policy also uh, talks about the past, the good past that we had. Gandhiji's uh, ideas also rest from there. The main thing that uh, probably I uh, uh, would like to point out that in between, after the East India Company came and education uh, was probably used by them and uh, consumerism, if you, if you look at uh, historically probably, the education, consumerism, came into education only during that period. Okay. Uh, earlier we, we were of this opinion that uh, education is a very divine thing and uh, you shouldn't be, you know, this is a divine thing, you are helping people, you are, uh, as many uh, uh, people you would approach, the knowledge would grow. Uh, we, we were, uh, as a nation itself, we were allowed to have any kind of idea from anywhere. Okay, so we were very open kind of in education. But uh, the Britishers and the colonial mindset, they started using education in some sense. Uh, they, they attached educated class uh, with the English speaking class. So that way, uh, 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 something kind of product was being sold that this is the education you should look for. So that education was kept uh, within a very small captive uh, kind of a um, consumer so that everybody, other, all others keep on longing for it. And you can actually sell it that ya to tum ye jo agitation hai, ye, ye chhod do. Uh, you come with this. So education was basically in the initial period. So you, you would see that IITs also, we, we established only after, the, uh, after getting independence. So engineering as such uh, was not their priority. Uh, education was basically, it was misused by them, uh, I would say, uh, even if it's harsh, but I would like to say, because consumerism was the main idea behind uh, putting equi uh, the education in this country by the colonial mindset. So, and that is what Macaulay also says, the same thing. Uh, so it was ba basically being used. And we'll have to, the national education policy in that sense uh, makes us free from that kind of a hangover. Uh, Gandhiji also, has also talked about the same thing, even in that period. Uh, the the scientific education, uh, science as such, Gandhiji never uh, said that it's wrong. Okay, but how, what kind of science? Because the idea, not only the idea, the purpose of education, the national education policy and the Gandhi's idea, if you see the similarity, the purpose of education, both of them talk in the same sense. Purpose is to serve the humanity. Purpose is to uh, make the last person get the benefit, okay. So in that sense, I can see a large similarity. I mean, almost uh, you can equate them, uh, whatever Gandhi said. And then you, if you talk about the, uh, uh, the hands-on approach, okay. I think probably the uh, colonial pe period, they did not want us to be that kind of a skilled so that we should become independent kind, okay? So they did not want us to become independent. They wanted to become dependent. 
whenever, whenever we uh, take a degree, then we look for a job. So they want this kind of a, a product from their education. But uh, now, and Gandhi was saying from the, uh, then and there itself, that you should have a hands-on approach. Once you, if you do not do anything to learn something, it is useless, okay. So he, he talked about the craftsman, he talked about the carpenters, he talked about the, and if you look at the National Education Program, they also talk about the same, same thing. So in that sense, the education and science, of course, science cannot mm, be taught without experimentation, with, without hands-on approach. Okay, I, I, I somehow uh, think that national education policy should be go, should have gone ahead in some uh, some areas more than what it has done, uh, in the sense that uh, when we attach the, the medical education, because medical education is always attached to uh, the hospitals. Okay, so whatever, whenever, whenever somebody does some experimentation, uh, hospitals, you you practice what you learn. Okay, same way the engineering institu institutions also, uh, they should be attached to some kind of a uh, workshop. Uh, I don't think it is there. Uh, uh, it should be actually other way around. Whatever, uh, wherever a workshop is there, there should be an educational institution, uh, the engineering institution. Same way, wherever hospital is there, there should be a medical institution there. So this way, the hands-on approach the practical uh, aspect of uh, learning, if that is to be inbuilt, and Gandhiji talked about that himself, and national education policy also talks about it. So. Do you want to share a little bit about the work that we did recently on the collect collective courses? Yeah. <clears throat> See, uh, while uh, this national education policy is giving us a flexibility, we need to think about how the uh, the adaptability of various skill set uh, opportunities can be given to the students and youth of our country. So what we have thought that uh, school education uh, is uh, fundamentally uh, governed by all the state uh, uh, government, but the opportunities should be given to the students. So. With the formal uh, curriculum which is going on in 10th, they have to minimum learn 10, uh, 5 subjects. Say similarly in uh, 11th and 12th, they need to go with the formal education uh, according to their choice. But it is equally important that uh, beside this, they develop certain skill set. And <coughs> their innate personality can also uh, be grown their understanding on uh, the life skills can be improved and their vision for the country can also be uh, nurtured so that uh, we get uh, the better future citizens. So that was the objective. So what we have thought that in school education beside the parallel curriculum and subsequently this is going to be correlated with the universities and higher education institution as well. So we have thought of creating uh, some activity-based learning in four major uh, verticals. The first vertical is for science, technology, innovation, wherein uh, they will be given the opportunity to learn about the basic fundamental problem, where the root cause is and how to address this root cause, as I have shared with you earlier. Second aspect was on entrepreneurship, commerce, and the uh, trade which is happening in society. So they equally need to learn. <clears throat> they need to develop the, uh, their skills on the practices like Shubh Labh Arth Vyavastha. So this is uh, a money which is coming from the good faith and spending in a good faith and which type of trade is useful for the society and how the trade can be uh, encouraged so that society gets the adequate return. So this is a fundamental uh, principle which even uh, now also it is having a relevance which uh, 
from the Gandhiji's thought also this is getting reflected. The third aspect was nurturing their uh, innate uh, creative talent. So creative talent might be in music, might be in a drawing, might be in designing something, might be in, <coughs> in doing something or writing uh, something, all those kinds of a creative expression. Ultimately, they need to express something. And by expressing, they will, they will also learn how to share the thoughts, how, the, uh, how to uh, listen the other people, which is uh, nowadays, I think, uh, in a WhatsApp uh, tune, this is becoming abbreviative, and this needs some change. And the fourth aspect, they need to groom their personality for the uh, various uh, uh, current uh, developments which is happening. I think uh, most importantly, they need to uh, be a morally a good citizen. And this experiments were also done on some high school. So in general uh, uh, phenomenon that uh, all these skill set were uh, given the opportunity to the students in school and they have uh, performed their examination without any supervision. Their moral uh, values, ethical standards and their, uh, their confidence on their knowledge was such a high level wherein they don't need any kind of a supervision. Teachers just need to distribute the papers, they will write an answer and exactly once their uh, time frame is over, they will collect the papers and they will submit it. This is happening in India and in a most remote tribal district of Madhya Pradesh. So all these experiments have a proof evidence. So how this can further be translated in various other parts of the country? And that exercise we have done together in this. So Sapun. Your perspectives on um, how do we drive this into the future? Because one of the challenges, uh, coming from the business side, I find that unless education is going to support the growth of the country, growth of uh, you know business, different areas that are there, how does the Gandhian thought, the uh, NEP policy, how will we use that to drive change in the country? I can't speak about how NEP would do this, but I can mention a few things that are in the periphery of what we were discussing. Uh, first of all, all intellectual property regimes are enmeshed in histories of colonialism. And there's way too much literature on this. There is plenty of literature on how each intellectual property regime has come up on theft and uh, stealing other people's work. There's lots of it. I don't need to get into that here. Uh, then uh, we're talking about stories. So here's a here's a story. The te the one text that was dearest to Gandhi was Hind Swaraj. It was published in 1909. He wrote it in 13 days, out of a terrible urge to just put his thoughts on paper, in a ship that too. When it was published, and the original was in Gujarati, it said, no rights reserved. He did not believe in copyright. In 1942, he changed that. Why? Did he suddenly have a change of heart in favor of uh, uh, capitalism? The scholars who've looked into this, and their, their reading is that Gandhi used the copyright law to subvert copyright. And in a way, he was prescient in doing this because he was anticipating the Creative Commons licenses of our age, the, <clears throat> the open general licenses that a lot of software companies use today. Uh, and he was, he was a lawyer by training. That he gave up the practice of law at the age of 35, considering it immoral is a different story, but he did have legal training, and he did understand how these regimes work. So at, in 1942, if he decides to use the copyright law, 
There's obviously a lot of complex thought going into it. And then there's another short story. Any of you, ha I mean, is there anybody here who hasn't heard the word, heard the word hacker? I'm assuming everybody's heard it. This is how the government works. Um, your, your consent is automatically obtained by how you ask the question. Uh, does anybody know who was the first hacker? Anybody would like to have a go? Who said that? Uh, that's not a name. <laughs> the first hacker is somebody called Richard M. Stallman. I know he wasn't Pakistani. Uh, he worked in the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. In 1971, he was in the habit of, uh, they used to get their printers from HP. And th there was a common printer for several floors. And people had to walk up to that floor to get their printouts. So when he realized the kind of chaos that this caused, Stallman took the codes of the printer, rewrote them, and inserted a little um, element that would give anybody who gave a print order, they'd get a pop-up notice saying, you are in queue, and then give another pop-up message telling them that your printout has appeared, and you can go and collect it. After a while, the printer was changed. And when the new printer arrived, Stallman went and asked for the codes to do the same thing again. And he was told, no, you can't have it because the company doesn't supply the codes anymore. So Stallman asked, if I buy the car, if I buy a car, I'm entitled to know how the engine works. I bought the whole thing. Why can't I change this? They said, no, it's intellectual property. So what did Stallman do? He hacked HP software. And that's how hacking started. From the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. Stallman is also the man who's put together, who has the greatest contribution in an operating system that's now called Linux. He never called it Linux. And that's come about, it's an operating system, I mean, think of it as a lock that has been designed and prepared by thieves for you. Because it is an operating system created by hackers. And even today, uh, what, up to 70% of servers internationally run on Linux? There is a lot of innovation that has gone there. And you're likely to get better tech support from the Linux community than you will get from any of the companies that sell their products asserting intellectual property. I'll give an example. I had a problem, and I had a problem at 2 o'clock at night, and I posted that on a group. And two minutes later, I got a patch because one of the developers was in Australia and he was awake. That's how the open source community works. Richard M. Stallman has spoken extensively about Gandhi, and you can read up on this. But we need to really rethink this, because the biggest challenge that our species has ever faced is climate change. And the ways to cope with climate change are today protected behind terribly repressive intellectual property regimes asserted by the countries which are more responsible for climate change than any other country. So we will really need to rethink our stand on intellectual property in the years to come as climate change begins to ask us deeply uncomfortable questions on things like development and growth, uh, uh, yeah, and other such. Is that okay? Should I stop here? So on that, I mean, see, it is a weapon. Intellectual property is a weapon. <coughs> How you use it is your call. How, say, it is a right given by a sovereign. So if country decides to behave in a particular way, the country will go in that side. If country decides not to do that way, it will go in the other side. So it is a right given by a sovereign. And if sovereign behaves well, everything will be bad. If sovereign behaves bad, it will be bad. And I'll give you an example how it is exploited, like you said. So everybody knows DDT, which is banned. 
but there is no real proof that DDT causes cancer and that is the premise under which it is banned. Okay. Why did it is banned? Because subsequent insecticides invented in the Western world were not as good as DDT. And so if you have to survive in the competition into the market, DDT was damn cheap, stays for six months, you have to spray only twice a year and is most effective. So what is what do you do? You kill the product. And Western world kill DDT. There is no real truth and there are enough number of articles that DDT does not cause cancer. And there are scientists who have expressed their voice against it. But sovereign, which are funding agencies around the world for insecticides, they kill DDT. So these are two entirely different stories. IPR is right given by sovereign and who gives the right to whom depends on and decides what will happen subsequently. DDT was there and still insect, it is not there. You can produce enough number. If DDT is available, chikungunya, malaria will not be there. Chikungunya was never heard when DDT was being sprayed. It came up, malaria came up when DDT was banned, in spite of everything being said. And more people die because of malaria and chikungunya and other diseases, dengue, then so-called cancer induced by DDT. But this is how sovereign things, and we follow them. And that's the first thing I say, that don't follow anybody blindly. Because somebody says because of his ulterior motive, and we follow it. So have your own observation, have your own judgment, and follow them. And as a sovereign, we can decide what we want. Like, I mean, somebody was saying about the products, etc., etc. So as a country, we have progressed. But where we have progressed, we have progressed in import substitution. We have not progressed in innovation because the whole thought focus has been import substitution. That these products we are importing, we should not import. We should save on our foreign exchange. We are not thinking in terms of we should export something, our own IP protected, and earn more money. China, though they started very late, they have gained in that. They have gained in that trip. Currently, there are few products which are of China origin, intellectually protected and American companies are trying to get those rights. While India still goes behind them, we are pro trying to say that, okay, give us, uh, I mean, the uh, right to produce at least in India for Indian people, for low in income people. We would like to provide cheaper medicines for masses, but if we have our own innovations, and if we promote those innovations, see this country, I mean, whether we like it or not, education policy, this or the previous one, or our funding agencies or the ecosystem does not promote disruptive thinking. We are always likely to have an incremental. Somebody has made a product in 10 rupees, I'll make it 8 rupees. Somebody has made it in 5 times, I'll make it 7 times. But we are not thinking that can I replace this and there are disruptive policies and disruptive products which makes you move forward. And we are averse to take this. And traditionally, we feel that whatever our teacher says, whatever the book says, whatever the journal says is a gospel truth. Nature says 30% of the articles published in nature cannot be reproduced. But we still believe that. May I respond to yes. one very small thing very quickly? Uh, I've had some experience of looking at malaria. We don't account for the innovation of mosquitoes and microbes because their innovation is not controlled by any policy. And no pesticide in the world can guarantee you a release from back malaria. What has this done is it's created India into the world's greatest superpower of, anti of, uh, micro, uh, of uh, antibiotic resistant microbes. Right? The, I, Those I, are also tagged there. there. I don't agree there. I mean, if you look at the number of infections and number of infections because of the antimicrobial resistance, those numbers are higher in Western world than in India. <laughs> Though everybody says India, so I'll give you example. It's a reporting I'll, I'll problem. Give example. I'll give you example. Lancet published the article for a clepsilian pneumonia, calling it a Delhi bug. But that bug was existing in England before it was invented in India. 
Okay, it was identified in the Delhi by Britishers, and they gave a name of Delhi. I've actually, to exist I've actually written about this, right? One of the problems that we have is we have such a um, we are so bothered about names that we forget that sometimes it's a little more important when 17 babies die in one nursing home than who gives what name to whom. Yeah. Right? And we are, there is, no, there is no country in the world that will compare with us on antibiotic abuse. We can just go and buy whatever we want. It's the same thing with pesticides. I'll tell you, I'll again counter that. Say, per capita antibiotic use is highest in Western world than in India. That's the first thing. Antibiotic misuse and abuse has been taught by the companies in Western world. Number three, antibiotic, antimicrobial resistance is more because of the antibiotic use in a poultry, which is highest in Western world. So these are the main reasons, but because it affects them, they are not highlighting that. So they will always highlight your problems. You are responsible for this happening. I am not responsible. And we follow that mindset. But and reality is... That's exactly how intellectual property regimes work also. No, no, intellectual property... See, US patent has nothing to do with India. If India does not agree, India does not grant a patent. So there is nothing to combine. See, knowledge can be same, but intellectual property right cannot be the same. Which is why you have arm twisting in WTO. But even then, even then we don't agree. See, it is a right given by a sovereign. So whatever America say, I mean, I'll give you example. There are enough examples in the patent world, and Undat can do that. U.S. has given a patent, and Europe has denied that. Europe has given a patent, and U.S. has denied that. So there are enough examples in the pharmaceutical as well as non-pharmaceutical, where patents are not granted around the world. And when the patents are not granted in, around the world, in those territories, non-proprietary things come. But in the pharma, there is another barrier. See, for a non-pharma, it is easy. Patent, non-patent, you can copy it. In the pharma, the other barrier is regulatory barrier. And regulatory barrier is a costly affair. Cost is not in making a drug. Cost is in making the product approved in that territory. And that's another non-IPR barrier. It's a trade barrier, but not related to IPR. There are so many Japanese products which are patented in Japan, not available in Europe or USA, because they don't have a muscle power to go in those countries. There are so many products in other parts of the world which are not around the world. Say, for example, classic example which everybody will correlate is uh, everybody knows nimesulide. Okay, nimesulide was original patent product for SKB. When they realized that this will not find adequate muscle power into the marketplace in relation to whatever is existing, they gave it up and a small company called Helsin bought the rights. Since Helsin did not have that power, it was available in few parts of the Europe and countries like India. Okay. So these are other side of the story because getting a product approved and commercializing requires a muscle power which has nothing to do with IPR. And that muscle power everybody can't have. So if the sovereign wants to do that, sovereign can help it. And that's how we could do it for so far, because sovereign wanted that we will relax the barrier, entry barrier other than IPR. We relax the entry barrier for IPR, but non-IPR entry barrier. I think what this, especially for the students, what this gives you a perspective is the same topic can have multiple views which are very, very differing based on the data, based on which they look at the matter, what kind of problems they are trying to solve. Coming from the business world, this is one of the things that we have had to, how do I bring it together? So companies say we want to be ethical, but if I'm in pharmaceutical industry, I will have certain drivers for action. You have to think about what is your value system, how are you going to stay within the values that you imbibe. And a lot of the educational foundation is what is going to drive that behavior for you. Because I'll give an example from the startup world. Two of the, uh, one, two of the startup organizations I'm involved with is in the blockchain. Blockchain is associated with cryptocurrency. If you look at the genesis of cryptocurrency, why did it start? 
It started with a 19-year-old who was looking at the fact that the regulator in their country was taking away, at least the way the story goes, is in Argentina, at the end of each day, whenever you got your salary, you converted it into dollar terms. Very short time later, I'm paraphrasing it, maybe factually not 100% correct, but what that did was when Argentina's regulator changed it so that you couldn't convert it from the Argentinian uh, currency into the dollar, they, the individual lost their funding. When you have a cryptocurrency, it's not managed by a regulator. That's why the sense of freedom, the kind of limitation that is posed by nations and institutions are not there. Having said that, coming from the banking side, I know the need for managing it because you have criminals who will misuse it. And that is also what's happened. So if I take these two examples, two extremes. Two extremes. So you will have that, and as individuals, when you go through something like the, your educational background, do you have the values that come in? So when we spoke about for the last two days on the Gandhian philosophy, what is the value system, which is what Unnaji was talking about with the Jabba example. So I'm going to hand over the uh, you know, microphone to him to share more both from the value system as well as from how he looks at it from the IP office. Or anything else? <laughs> Definitely, uh, <clears throat> there is a need that uh, we start thinking uh, from the perspective to have the higher value standards. Because both the examples are extreme and it is uh, really going to uh, create a block, roadblocks uh, in the society. Something which is extremely open and then we are not recognizing is also not good. Something which is uh, open but uh, somewhere I think uh, we are not appreciating the existence and trying to find the mimic around the new uh, just for the commercial gain is also not good. So we need a balanced approach. We need to uh, understand that IP creation is important, but how much IP is getting commercialized is equally important. And, and uh, I would like to mention here that uh, getting a one patent, how much efforts are required. So uh, uh, you might be knowing. But we also need to realize that 97% of a patent are not coming out of a piece of a paper, not exploited so far. <coughs> and all, all across, all across the world. And even, even in 3%. Huh. So <laughs> out, of a, out of a 1 lakh patent, only 5,000 are going into the product. And out of the 5,000 product, there might be a 100 patent which is reaching to the clinical trial, trial stage. And out of 100, only 10 will get the product in the market. And for bringing this 10, how much of a manpower investment, time investment, scientific uh, resources deployment. So this is a very hard earned success. I think it should be recognized enough adequately. Again, the focus for this 10 should be to serve the society. We have a ample of a problem, but we need the approach in the society who address this problems with the creative solution. And even if we have a creative solution, so many such UPI, we can say governments, innovation in the governance. So financial disruption, we can say that. So this disruption has even forced the Google, WhatsApp, 
to adopt the UPI. And the transaction is most secured, most uh, efficient, and in a very less time. Other enable transactions. Again, it was, a, it was a database, but now effectively utilize this database. Again, again, the example, we can say that uh, ONDC, which is going to come, this is going to be a biggest disruption in the e-commerce. So we all might have done the online e-commerce transaction using various platforms. There is a forcing that you need to have the enrollment to that particular API. You need to, uh, the seller also need to have the enrollment to that uh, API. And then both need to connect through that same platform. And they done the transaction using the same platform. Even if you are buying through, say, as a one particular uh, e-commerce platform, that platform will guide you to the uh, relevant financial entity. And there is a cut here, commission which is going into this. So, uh, say, as a, even, even the app who has downloaded, you may not be knowing, but that download entity may be a, if you have downloaded with Play Store. So Play Store is also getting something. So cost is getting loaded at each and every stage. This is going to get eliminated in ONDC. And this is the another disruption, disruption which is going to happen. So we need such solution, disruption, which is happening for the society and for addressing the challenges which society is facing. And I think that disruption started and the idea conceptualized by Gandhiji. Even, even uh, more than 100 years before. And that kind of a disruption is required even nowadays also. And the journey has already started and I think we need to join this journey. That's what I mean to say here. Uh, after listening to these two extremes and when uh, Unnati was talking about and I was thinking about the, the theme, the Gandhi's concept, I think the underlining thing is integrity. Integrity, integrity, integrity. You as youngsters, students, youth, the new innovators have to think about the fact that how in an ethical manner, in a proper manner, we try to bring about these disruptions, these positive things within our society and not actually try to con our society and work on basis of that. That's one of the very important aspects. Responsible innovation, socially responsible innovation, professionally responsible innovation, academically uh, responsible innovation. Whatever you are thinking about, whatever you are building it up, be very responsible about it. Sapunji was giving an example about the first hacker and how things were working up. But everything was being done within limits in a responsible manner to remove certain bottlenecks which were being created because so many people leaving their desk and going to collect the print, print out when they were not required was actually wastage of man hours. And if you calculate the wastage of those man hours, there would be maybe hundreds of days over a period of one year. So that's what... Um, uh, Madam comes from banking sector, so she must, she must be aware of the fact that how crucial it is within the service industry if you waste manas and how agitated your customer bec uh, or consumer becomes. So the basic factor that we have is that we have to be very, very responsible. As youth, you are going to lead the society, you are lead, going to lead the country, but integrity, learning from Gandhiji's concept, integrity is going to be a very, very important underlying concept of everything that we are speaking about over here, that we are talking about over here. Uh, I think uh, Gandhiji has already said something on this itself, that if the science is not going to help uh, the poor 
to get the benefit, then this is not science. It's not science. So innovation should be should have a purpose behind it. And the purpose uh, will have to be uh, found in a way in which the national education policy has also written and Gandhiji has always uh, preferred. So you'll have to find a purpose. If you are going to help the society, then these problems would not be there. But if your purpose is lost, if your purpose is uh, narrow, then uh, the, the education, the, the uh, purpose of the education itself would be lost. So ethics, moral, uh, all these would be governed by these uh, aspects only. Gandhiji had one uh, simple criteria test to see that if your innovation, if the science is not going to help the last person in the, uh, in the queue, then that science is not good. So if you are uh, creating an industry by snatching uh, livelihood of many, uh, you shouldn't go for that. Okay, so if you have something, uh, uh, some innovate, innovation which can be implemented by many so that they all can grow, implement it. Okay, so choice of what kind of science, what kind of innovation, so that, that is always there. And that would be basically driven by the morale, the ethics that we, are, we have built in. And we need to build those values. Um, would you like to share something? Um, I think we are doing well. We are doing well. So we'll throw this open to, huh? So, I mean, when I was a kid, I read Satyana Prayoga, Autobiography of Gandhiji. And at that point in time, it was always truth, 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 truth. But as I grew up, I realized Gandhiji was the biggest disruptor. And he had a courage to challenge dogma and conduct experiments. If we learn these three, as a scientist, we'll be well off. I think um, this gives us an opportunity to open up. Yeah, open. Yes, it's open. open. Why don't you take the mic? We have. We have. Yeah. We have. It's not a question. It can be taken as observations and comments. And almost integrating uh, what Rakesh was telling. When you do science, the integrity is most important. But then the debate between Prasad Kumar, what was saying, and Sapan Jesse between and the, uh, uh, how much do we believe the science? Now, when we talk about science, this is what I agree with Dr. Kamar. Now, everybody, we think of talking about science and we have to believe in science, and this is what we call scientific temper. But the scientific temper has to be also be governed by high degree of integrity. Unfortunately, today science, as you rightly said, it will be largely guided by market. And there are vested interests involved into that. So when we read the scientific content, even in a very high flown journals and high impact factor journals, there has to be a judgment has to come. And how do we decide that what is published in nature, they were guided by, they were funded by big giants. And then finally, we don't have to trust it. Or even the nomenclature, say, the bug which is named by a country. I think all debate we know, if you want to go back, why was HIV named as HIV? why it was not called, it was a fight between two names, between HTLV4 and the, uh, and the LAV, between Lukman Tanier and Bob Gallo, and how the, uh, the synergy came between the two presidents had to come in to give a name as HIV, and why do we came to um, call it as a, uh, now uh, the COVID, uh, not calling as a different names like Mars and others, uh, because, or the Nipah virus, or the, so, there's a, so what we have to be, what we're talking about, intellectual property right and et cetera, we have to also be careful about, and there has to be judicious judgment. Who judges? Do we believe market? Do we believe our integrity and do we guide it? That is what I want to keep it over for. I, I, I want to hear from each one of you. Or if you can, there's a very thin line between market, our integrity, and what we call as a high degree of science. If I have made my point clear, 
but in, in, to open the debate once again on that line. मुझे लगता है कि एक जो हमारा समाज जिस तरह से चलता है ना, we we are used to listening to a, a structure in which we say that it is a democratic structure, socialism, uh, capitalism. एक हमारे पास अपना था पहले, वो society क्या थी? वो धर्म आधारित कहते थे हम। धर्म आधारित मतलब आप बिजनेस कर रहे हो, you know that you have built in something that cost you this much, but you have taken this much of uh, profit, and now this profit will have to be shared to the society with the society. Okay, that attitude is missed now. Okay, मुझे ध्यान आता है कि बार कोई किसी इंस्टिट्यूट के डायरेक्टर थे उन्होंने कहा था कि उनके कॉलेज में किसी इंजीनियरिंग इंस्टीट्यूट इंस्टीट्यूट उनके कॉलेज में किसी बच्चे को एक करोड़ रुपए की नौकरी लग गई गूगल में देन ही कॉल्ड हिम कि भई तुम्हारे एक करोड़ रुपए की नौकरी लग गई महीने की आप इंस्टीट्यूट को क्या दोगे तो उसने कहा इंस्टीट्यूट को क्यों देना आपको तो फीस दे दिया मैंने आपको क्या बनता है आपको फीस देता हूं मैं तो बोला अच्छा नहीं बनता हमने इतनी मेहनत करी इतने सारे टीचर्स होते हैं तो इसी के तो पैसे देते हैं हम और दिस माइंडसेट नीड्स टू बी चेंज्ड तो अपने फादर को दे दो परिवार को तो दोगे नहीं उनके पास बहुत है नो दिस माइंड वो तो फादर तक ही नहीं आ रहा है तो आप पड़ोसी और समाज की बात आप कहाँ से करोगे तो हाउ वुड यू बिल्ड दिस काइंड ऑफ एन एटीट्यूड in students which uh, the uh, earlier education whatever education we had that that aspect was missing pehle hamare purane isme hota tha ki wo gurukul mein padhte the to they were sent to the society jao aap bhiksha leke aao that that probably gave them them the idea that the whatever the education they are getting this is some kind of an obligation that they are getting from the society. But uh, that they were going to the society to get something so that the Gurukul is sustained. This idea, the, the learning of this idea itself was important probably earlier. Or tabi wo training vasi hoti thi. To amne job kuch bhi sikha wo samaj ko dena hai hame. अगर ये हम नहीं रखेंगे तो फिर मार्केट ड्रिवन सोसाइटी तो अब तो है इसमें कितना हम बचेंगे और कितना हम बचने की कोशिश करेंगे पता नहीं धन्यवाद आई थिंक इट्स वेरी वेल सेड द फाउंडेशन नीव जो है बहुत ही स्ट्रॉन्ग होनी चाहिए बट वन थिंग आई कीप थिंकिंग अबाउट इज इंडिया नीड्स टू ड्रीम एंड ड्रीम अबाउट वॉट वी वॉन्ट टू क्रिएट इफ आई गो बैक टू वॉट यू सेट अबाउट द थियोरीज The first time I understood that allopathy was not the only way to treat the human body, I was around 17. I just said no to joining AFMC, the medical college. My father is a doctor. And I started looking at Ayurveda and the other systems. I felt so guilty because my father was an allopath. But it also made me realize that there are different ways of looking at the human body and finding solutions. I genuinely believe that unless we build a mindset of questioning, uh, skepticism of what we hear and learn, but with a positive mindset to understand how true is it, and if this is the best knowledge that we have, we have to use it. But so f we need to understand what is theory and what will go, uh, you know, the classical uh, physics which is there, which is fairly structured in a certain way, but your uh, quantum physics has kind of broken that barrier. What will come from that thinking? We are not putting those systems thinking into our day-to-day -day lives. This is the limitation. What's the future way of looking at it? For me, I think coming from the space that I am, one of the reasons I got involved in this whole NEP conversation is what can we do today so that 25 years from now, the people who are in this room, they will take it forward. What is the change that you're going to make? And in that, what do we break 
from the past, what we hold from the past, what is very evident is the value system, the foundational thing, things which have been experimented and done. So given that, I think we do need to have a very scientific mindset as we go forward. So now responding to your query, so you were trying to link high impact journal innovations and products and markets. Now, high impact journal is again a market driven because I'll give two examples. Everybody, everybody knows mRNA vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna. But what was at the back of that? Lady by name Kariko, she's Hungarian, migrated to USA. You know, she was not given grants, forget the publication. She was denied grants and she was demoted from a tenure track position. She was demoted because she was not getting grants. But still she persisted, and if she would not have persisted, we would not have give, got mRNA vaccine. Okay? So this is nothing to do high impact. She's never published in high impact journal. High impact journal may publish kar di, so usko grant bhi mil di. Wo low impact journal bhi nahi publish kar pati di. This leo uski grant chali gai. Tenure track chala gai. Demote ho gai. But she persisted because she believed in the science. The other example is another big product which is a checkpoint inhibitor, which is making wonders in cancers, for which Honjo Japanese got a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Everybody will know it. But in his Nobel Prize lecture, he said that if you do disruptive science, no high impact journal will publish it. And none of his publications are in the impact factor more than 10. Okay? And still, he created a product, he created a science, product, Nobel Prize, and that product is the highest selling product in the world wide. It's break all the records. And it is so disruptive that people have started thinking that cancer can be cured. And he had no high impact journal publication. So these are two separate stories. High impact journal, because high impact journal is a review system, and no disruptive will come so quickly. So if you believe in your observation, if you believe in your gut feelings, and if you believe that I'm on the right track, forget high impact journal. But our education system around the world plays a role. What is your impact factor? What is your sky index? What is your edge index? Then you get promoted. If you have no publication, you don't get promoted. So this is what we should distance ourselves. But then it becomes very difficult to judge what is the value of what somebody has contributed. Because these are long term projects. Developing a product is a long-term project, while publishing a paper is a short-term project. So we should be mindful of that. So have I answered you correctly, or shall I give more examples? Yeah, OK. Sir. Sir. Yeah, sure. Oh, man, you go ahead, then I'll, you go ahead, then I'll speak. Sir, uh, again, uh, if you try to correlate the values and the commercial purpose, there is a classic case that one of the big pharma company who has killed their own product as it was going to be off patent and promoted a new product to substitute this entire market to the new product. There so I can give the names. Terfinadine huh. and Fexofinadine. Huh. Fexofinadine, Terfinadine Gabapentine, Fregabaline. Real example. <laughs> Fexofinadine was approved. I mean, Terfinadine patent was getting expired and they had brought out fexofenadine. It is the only minor change. The effect is same. Fexofenadine got approved in USA. So to US FDA, company said, terfenadine is toxic, so please ban it. But fexofenadine yeah. was not approved in Europe. So in Europe, the same company said, this product is safe and you should not ban it. Same company, two different things at same time. <laughs> yeah, but so. see, this, is, this is checks and balance. This has nothing to do with the science. See, checks and balance is a regulatory authority. Regulatory authority, see, if you go through pharma industry, all patented products will get banned or become toxic only at the end of their patent life. <laughs> <laughs> and th there are going to be ample publication to support this. And then those publications will be without significant support. But to counter that, see, all this started, I mean, if you look from a pharma perspective, See, European domination, Americans wanted to have their domination. So they raised the bar, make it difficult for a small companies to come to product to the market. 
and get the market share. So America being a big market, everybody started following it. They were not following their science, they were following the market. Now America has realized that we have achieved what we wanted to do, so they are re re reducing the bar. So now it's very difficult to get the product approved in the USA. And that's the reason now if you look at a five years product approval, you don't get any single lifestyle disease product. No antihypertensive new product, no antimicrobial new product, no, I mean, lipid lowering new product, significant. All the products are now going towards orphan drugs, yeah. cancers, which are small number, high value. And this high value will continue as long as Americans pay for it. Can you think of a product, one month therapy, one lakh dollar? That's happening in US. Product which is used for 500 people makes one billion dollar. Okay, so that's how the market is driving, but that market is driven by American government, not by the company. And as soon as the American government changes the rule game, everything changes. So if you look before, I mean 2012, you get the product, antihypertensive, lipid lowering, one after the other. Now you don't get it because Americans have changed the rule game, rule games of the rule, and this is government. That has nothing to do with the IPR. R government changed the rule that if you want a product to be approved, it has to be better than before. And it's very difficult to prove that it's better than before because antihypertensive gets approved by margin of five millimeter. To prove that this is five meter better with the standard deviation of three, I need hundreds of thousands. So it's impossible because it's so expensive and then to get into the market, so they have stopped it. So this is how the government checks and balance. This IPR is one part we are looking, but then the other part, which are checks. And checks are coming from a government regulator for a pharma industry. I just wanted to say something very uh, briefly. One, you know, Dr. Pandey, sorry, uh, Dr. Pandey, it's nice to imagine a utopian world in the past. You know, we all like to sort of idealize the past. We were very and we were the and we the Shri Ram ke hi ghar mein, unhi ke chal kapat se ghar mein, unko jana pada van mein. Subhav humans ka badla nahi hai. Wo tab bhi waisa tha, aaj bhi tha. Bharat ka itihaas mein prachin kaal se dekh raha. Hoon aaye, kushan aaye. Sab jagah dhokha ta padiya tha. Koi idhar se darwaza khol deta tha, kile ka koi kuch karta tha. So let's not idealize. Us samay bhi achche log the, aaj bhi hai. Mujhe nahi lagta hai ki hume nirash hona chahiye. युवा पीढ़ी को मैंने अच्छी तरह से परखने की कोशिश की है काफी मेरा अनुभव रहा है और ये बड़े सरलता से आदर्शवादी बन जाते हैं और फिर निष्ठा से काम भी करते हैं एक वर्ग है भारत में युवा पीढ़ी का जो वंचित रहा है मैं किसी कास्ट की बात नहीं कर रहा हूं उसमें हर तरह के लोग हैं उसके अंदर एक भूख है एक जिज्ञासा है एक जोश है कुछ करने के लिए नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी के सामने यह चुनौती है कि उनको दिशा दे गतिशील बनाए मार्गदर्शन दे ये जितनी समस्याओं की आप बात कर रहे हैं उसका समाधान निकल आएगा मैं दावे के साथ कह रहा हूं मैं देख चुका हूं अनुभव कर चुका हूं अब चुनौती हम सबके लिए है और दूसरी बात जो डॉक्टर खमार हाई इंपैक्ट की बात कर रहे थे मैं आपको एक ट्रू स्टोरी सुनाता हूं कितनी बेईमानी धोखा दपड़िया साइंस के वर्ल्ड में होती है 2010 में इंटरनेशनल कांग्रेस ऑफ मैथमेटिशियंस के सेशन में एक प्लेनरी लेक्चर था इंटरनेशनल कांग्रेस ऑफ मैथमेटिशियंस चार साल में एक बार होती है और करीब दस हजार से अधिक मैथमेटिशियंस आते हैं दुनिया भर से अलग अलग जगह होती है उस प्लेनरी लेक्चर में एक मैथमेटिशियन ने एक कहानी सुनाई एक वन ऑफ द रियली वेल नोन जर्नल ऑन कॉम्प्यूटेशनल मैथमेटिक्स नॉट मैथमेटिक्स बट समथिंग टू डू विथ कंप्यूटर साइंस उसमें दो मैथमेटिशियंस और कंप्यूटर साइंटिस्ट ने मिल्क एक मैथमेटिशियन कंप्यूटर साइंस मिल्क एक पेपर भेजा पब्लिकेशन के लिए वो एक्सेप्ट हो गया पब्लिश हो गया वट डिड दे डू दे डिड नथिंग उन्होंने खेल समझ लिया था अपने रेफरेंसेस में वही पेपर साइट किए जो उस जर्नल में छपे थे और लंबी लिस्ट बना के खूब लंबी और अंदर कीवर्ड्स इस्तेमाल किए जो उस एरिया के कीवर्ड्स थे जगह जगह डाल दिए लेकिन द पेपर मेड एब्सोल्यूट नॉनसेंस इन टर्म्स ऑफ कंप्यूटर साइंस नॉनसेंसिकल पेपर था और वो छप गया 
वो जनरल अभी तक थ्राइव कर रहा है उसका कुछ नहीं बिगड़ा दिस वॉज एक्सपोज एट द इंटरनेशनल कांग्रेस ऑफ मैथमेटिशियन ऑन पब्लिक फोरम किसी ने किसी के ऊपर केस नहीं किया किसी ने कहा नहीं कि वहां नहीं पब्लिश करेंगे वहां अभी भी लोग पब्लिश कर रहे हैं क्या स्टैंडर्ड्स हैं तो एब्सोल्यूट जानबूझ के उन्होंने एक एब्सोल्यूट नॉनसेंस पेपर छपवा लिया छप भी गया किसी ने कोई रेफरिंग नहीं की कुछ नहीं किया हाई इंपैक्ट जर्नल था वी नीड टू समहाउ फाइंड वेज इन मींस ऑफ गेटिंग आउट ऑफ दिस रैट रेस आई थिंक दैट्स दैट्स व्हाई वी नीड द मोर एथिकल स्टैंडर्ड ऑन इंडिविजुअल लेवल we need the patriotic values inculcated among the citizens and that's essentially mahabharat ke kal mein bhi matlab panch log the aur 100 log the samne dono hi aur se galat cheeze bhi hui hai aur enough iske praman bhi hai lekin ant mein yahi samvad bhi raha aur yahi message bhi raha ki satya ki jeet hoti hai to satya ke kis aur jana hai ye aaj ki yuva peedhi ko hame sikhana and i think national education policy the message from the life of mahatma gandhi is teaching us in a flashons and that would be the real adoption of this session i i believe that uh any last comments before we start wrapping up when any discussion on a complex matter reaches the stage where it is on the one hand this but on the other that's a good time to call call time <laughs> especially given that two people on the panel have flights to catch <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand there are others who don't have a flight to catch <laughs> no but you have an online session coming after this <laughs> i think online session is going to start in 3 minutes <laughs> oh 3 minutes nay nee. only 3 minutes 5 baje आप सबके हाथ से बाहर निकल गया मामला द लेडी इज कम बट ऑन बोथ द हैंड्स वी हैड वंडरफुल स्पीकर्स एंड वी वुड लव टू हियर मोर आई मीन इफ इफ यू डिट हैव फ्लाइट्स टू कैच वी वुड हैव लव दिस सेशन टू गो ऑन इट वॉज वंडरफुल द पैनल डिस्कशन वॉज वंडरफुल कैन वी हैव अ बिग राउंड ऑफ अप्लॉज फॉर आर स्पीकर्स and now ladies and gentlemen it's time that we thank and felicitate our speakers so to do the honors may i invite shri rajneesh wadwa dean external affairs sgt university so may i request you to honor dr bakulesh khamar executive director kadila pharmaceuticals on behalf of sgt university for having cheering the session so well thank you so much sir for taking out from time out from your busy schedule gracing this occasion you need to accept it can we now uh, thank professor unnat pandit controller general of patents design and trademarks government of india thank you so much sir <laughs> dr parikshit manhas from the university of jammu thank you sir shri sopan joshi 
an astute author, environmentalist, and a narrator par excellence, which we just witnessed. <laughs> Sir, we wanted more of you, but I think there was a shortage of time. You're really putting me in danger of Dr. Kumar. Yeah. <laughs> Right hand was dominant, right hand is always dominant, correct? <laughs> <laughs> and I was right hand of moderator. <laughs> and he was far off from the also. <laughs> uh, maybe... Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being a wonderful speaker. Uh, may we now honor our moderator, Ma'am Sandhya Vasudevan. Ma'am so kindly consented to moderate the session. At the last moment, thank you so much, Ma'am. And it, the job was wonderfully done. Thank you so much. I once again thank the chair, the speakers, and moderator for having conducted the session wonderfully. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah, if the volunteers could help, uh, sir, with the bag and. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, now we'll have a short break for tea and after that we have the online session. So we are here after 15 minutes. Thank you so much. We break for a cup of tea now. Thank you.
Good evening. Okay, now I'm audible. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. I, Dr. Reshu Sanan, on behalf of SGT University, welcome you all after the short and sweet tea break. For the next and the final session of the day, the speakers are going to be joining us online. We start with Professor Vandana Saxena, who is an experienced professor at Delhi University with a demonstrated history of working in the research industry. We welcome you, ma'am, to start your session and contribute in the deliberation on Gandhi's concept of education and national education policy 2020. Welcome, ma'am. Let's welcome, ma'am, with a huge round of applause, please. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes, ma'am, you are. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this amazing opportunity. Um, 
I think I need to start with uh, Mr. Chaturvedi, who has been a super senior uh, at Delhi University um, and, and a very energetic and uh, promising uh, Dr. Amit Suman, who has introduced me to the forum. Um, thank you so much for uh, letting me in. I was when I was going through the program. I realized that the kind of people who are going to be speaking up here are, are very critical for the entire idea of education and how education is going to uh, is going to unwind in the years to come. Something which is absolutely important and critical for all of us to understand. Um, I wish I was there like everybody else, but due to certain reasons, I'm not able to make it and I know that the loss is all mine. I'm missing the warmth and the grace of that entire gathering. Um, so maybe another time, uh, most probably, yeah. Um, when we're coming up to this concept of the theme of the conference, you know, that is being slated uh, for the day, I think it's a... Uh, um, it's very important for us to understand that um, how we are looking at Mr. Gandhi and how we are looking at the LEP. Uh, when I use the word Mr. Gandhi, uh, it's, it's like, it's a problem that I face. So I'm going to be sharing with all the audience today a little bit of issues that I've had, a um, little bit of my own personal conflicts that I've had in the area of education and that is why I use the word Mr. Gandhi. Because, you know, it seems that in most of our conversations, uh, I myself at many number of times and at many number of times I've heard the other people uh, doing it, that they are, they are, they are, they are looking at uh, uh, Gandhi as a person. Um, I'm at a stage, you know, where I can't claim that I know all about uh, him or his philosophy or his way of life. But I'm in a place where I've definitely realized that Gandhi is a persona, Gandhi is a thought, and Gandhi is not a person, for me at least anymore. So that is why I'm saying that when I looked at the, when I looked at the theme of the conference, it became very... Uh, very, I was very intrigued with the idea when we are talking about Gandhi's philosophy on education because I think Gandhi is is in himself. I want to really use the word itself because I'm connecting Gandhi to a thought uh, is education. So that is the place where you know that is the place where I want to start uh, placing my arguments uh, from. So when we are looking at Gandhi as a, as an idea. Uh, the perception changes. For me, at least it has changed. I don't know what kind of implication it will have for the people uh, in the forum. Uh, we'll definitely have a bit of discussions on this and then we'll realize that how, how, how coherent we are on these views. You know? uh, Gandhi looks like a very recent phenomenon which happened just 100 years ago. And I, you know, it's easy for me to remember Gandhi because he was born exactly 100 years before me. So it's very easy for me to remember the birth year of Gandhi. You know? So when we're talking about this, I think Gandhi is one of the phenomena that has happened in the recent past. And that is why uh, we are very, uh, he becomes one of our favorites, you know. Uh, there were very contemporaries at the time of Gandhi. I think quite a lot of them who thought about education, who fought for the freedom of the country and things like that. But Gandhi continues to be um, extremely differentiated amongst his own tribe. I'm, if, uh, if I'm just saying it in all good sense, you know, the people who are his contemporaries, Gandhi, uh, seems to outstand that entire configuration of people at that point of time. And I think that is something which is very critical for us to understand that why Gandhi stands out? Why are we talking about Gandhi's vision on education or Gandhi... Um, as a philosopher in education, why are we looking at this entire, uh, you know, the idea uh, or the the kind of uh, uh, the kind of image that we have created for uh, Gandhi's life for all of us? Uh, I can't say to follow, but at least to understand. At least to understand that. How, you know, because following is something which is going to be very, very personal. People will have their own reason to follow or not to follow. That is a perfectly open uh, word for us to understand. But definitely to understand that what this, you know, this entire idea of a life was. And it is at this point of time that I want to say that because 
through this forum we are trying to connect education with uh, 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 Gandhi and we are trying to connect a document, a document which is the NEP document, NEP 2020 document with a uh, with a kind of a philosophy. I think it becomes important for us to understand whether this document is something uh, which we can actually compare. So if Gandhi is an idea for me, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, share my views in this entire context. So if Gandhi is an idea for me, is NEP also an idea for me or is it something else? Now that's, that's the basic point which I want to bring forth uh, to all of us and then we can have more discussions about that. So for me, I think um, both are visionaries. The document and the philosophy are both visionaries. They have set up a vision for how we see uh, the entire scenario around us to be, how we see um, the future of the people in uh, the state of India. And I think that is something which is very, very important. Um, so document, definitely yes, because it is organized into some 60 plus pages, definitely yes. But each segment of the document that is under discussion for the last two days with this, uh, within this gathering, I think it's very important uh, for me. I'm, I'm using the important time and again, not because uh, I don't have an alternative word for it, but I think that is how I want to start the, uh, that is how I want to start the concentration or the emphasis of my argument to be. That both looks like, to me, both these, um, the, both these entities are visionary in nature. Um, and they, because they are visionary in nature, for all of us in education, uh, it gives us a lot of scope that how, uh, you know, we kind of conceptualize the education in time to come. So that is exactly the point of uh, departure for me when I'm saying that I try to move from uh, Gandhi's uh, personhood to Gandhi as an idea. And then, of course, I'm talking about the policy, not as a document, but as another idea of how we are trying to locate the future, uh, how we are trying to locate, or how we are trying to ra rather address uh, the future um, of this entire uh, country uh, with, in context to each other. I come from a physics background, so it is like, you know, it is relative in context to each other. And also at the same time in context to an international scenario which we are going to be following. So, um, let's try to look at it like this, you know, that Gandhi went to, went abroad to study as a person, you know. But when he came back, you know, he was a grounded man. When he started talking about India, he spoke about India from the soil of it. He did not say that we have to bring in certain things from XYZ place and implant these here. His entire idea of basic education was located in how the people in, the, in their own context will grow. And this is exactly how the policy also looks at that entire educational experiences of the people in a given context. So contextualizing education is something which is a very, uh, very matching kind of a very coherent kind of an idea that goes across uh, both the visions that we are trying to understand and uh, separately also and in relation to each other also. So I think that kind of idea which is coming to us is uh, uh, is taking us further, which is telling us that, okay, so the education has to be contextualized. There's a lot of conversation about um, which language should education go. And uh, if we try to look at both the ideas, we will say that both the ideas have propagated the mother tongue or the native language of the child as uh, or or anybody actually in fact uh, education in both these ideologies have has not been limited only to the children they have crossed on age groups because education has not been seen in the very conventional banner of uh, you know schooling from one grade one to twelve or things like that so uh, yeah so what i was trying to say is that the one of the first contested idea uh, for, uh, for for us to understand would be that what should be the medium of instruction if we are talking about education, how in what 
language education could be provided and i think uh, both the ideologies are pretty clear on this that it needs to be provided in the native language of the person whom we are addressing the second important thing we can see is that it transits the boundary of school education is much wider concept in both the ideologies uh, nep as well as uh, the gandhian way of looking at things so i think transacting those boundaries moving out of the classroom telling people that education is not only the uh, what do we say is not only learning the books but it is also learning skills is something which is so prominently located in both the ideas i think that we need to be very very critically looking at it so these are the kind of um, Uh, you know these are the kind of projections that we as practitioners are getting uh, from the uh, from both the ideas uh, that is under consideration and another important thing is and obviously you know those who know me uh, would say that you had to say this because i am working in the area of inclusion and diversity both uh, the ideas uh, place uh, contest rather Uh, the homogeneous positioning of india india is this india is this india is this this idea has been contested in both the ideas uh, both the ideas have spoken about diversity across india that and that is where i said you know in fact i could have spoken this point earlier to begin the uh, begin the kind of a, uh, derivatives that we are taking both the ideas but uh, yeah but nevertheless so you know they both uh, believe in the idea of diversity both of them um, locate the entire uh, practice of education in diversity so what is what do we mean by that we are trying to say that um, in both the philosophy we, we would hear people talking about um, social diversity economic diversity and neurodiversity this is something which is uh, very amazingly um, you know coherent in in both the uh, ideologies uh the diversity which we are talking about it is not only spoken up as a, as a kind of a as a kind of a promotion uh, tagline uh, inclusion and diversity but no it is spoken up as something where in the practicality of it is also included and when we say about practicality what do we mean by that we understand that there is an idea of appreciating the local art and culture and the folk songs and everything which belongs to an indigenous space and at the same time there is also an um, a kind of a contestation that all this uh, should move to a higher uh, platform uh, all this should move out of the native context also and more people should get familiar with what is the local context and more people get familiar with the cultural context of the of a given space and in a, in a given time uh, that is being insisted upon so i think <coughs> that's another very interesting and important um dimension for all of us to look at when we are uh, when we are uh, trying to understand the two perspectives um along with each other i don't want to say in relation to each other but along with each other when we, we are when we are trying to understand this so this um, idea of diversity is this idea of diversity just slated or are we also trying to talk about diversity across different uh, stages Uh, which are localized in both the ideologies so i think there is a lot of conversation about how diversity needs to be acknowledged first of all because many number of time we fail to acknowledge diversity so how diversity needs to be acknowledged how it needs to be appreciated and then how we need to you know develop those collaborative practices where diversity actually becomes a way of thinking and we start whenever we go one word that i'm always contesting in education is singularity you know aisa nahi hota it doesn't happen like that then you know you are doing this and this will happen this will happen this will happen there are no linear pathways in education uh, well i can say that for 99.9 percent cases uh for point 1% cases there could be a linear transition which is which has happened and people have experienced that but in most cases uh, uh there is no singularity in life 
and there is a kind of a, a multiplicity that we are always talking about. So understanding those kind of domains uh, would mean that when we are thinking about planning and organization and organizing any of the educational experiences, it is critical and important for us to understand that that diversity, the nuances of diversity is, is kind of, you know, kept in mind. We have, uh, we have, in fact, we should have moved away from these questions much earlier, but with this policy vision coming to us, we need to move ahead of many, uh, many such questions which relate to why are you here, why, uh, why, can't you go to another organization? Why this is not a place for you? I think these are the kind of questions that will have to be uh, that will have to be. They don't have to be buried. Uh, we need to kind of counter them, address them, and make them redundant. So I'm not trying to say that the question die, but I'm trying to say these questions at the process of planning and organization become redundant. So that is the word, exact word that I want to use because these are such questions which are so deeply grounded in the mindsets, in the belief systems of the people that we can't say that we just want to bury them away or do something like that. But we have to make, as educationists, we have to make a persistent effort to create a situation where these questions become redundant and we understand that we are in an exceptionally different paradigm of work and education and connecting people with education that these questions hold no significance in this new paradigm of education which we are going to evolve and which we are going to work on. So multidisciplinarity is another point which is very emphatically spoken about. Multiplicity of cultures, multiplicity of livelihoods, multiplicity of life skills, everything is there. That is how we are defining a culture. Multiplicity of, uh, you know, the, the dress and the, uh, and the food, which we are very, very, uh, all of us, I think, are fond of. In fact, uh, when Madam started with the session, she spoke about the tea that we have had. So I think in Indian culture, we have a lot of importance for food and uh, for food and uh, uh, and meeting and chatting over the food. That one of an amazing uh, learning experiences that we have had. So I think that's important for us to understand that all this when it is coming, how you know the one is connected to another. Can I say that? Social sciences is not connected to literature. Can I say that literature is not connected to mathematics? Can I say mathematics is not connected to art? Or can I say that art is not connected to physics or physics is not connected to biology? So all of us who are sitting here will be able to appreciate this point that at some juncture, we are finding these crossways, you know. Every uh, discipline is crossing another discipline. But what we need is we need to have a vision of that kind wherein we understand that wherein we are able to identify and locate these cross sections. So what is the challenge for us? Multidisciplinarity would not mean that, you know, uh, four of us from different disciplines come together and we start having a conversation around the whole thing. No, I don't think that the meaning of a multidisciplinary context. The meaning of a multidisciplinary context is that the idea by itself is, uh, you know, that we are able to locate these intersectionalities across different disciplines and we are arrive at an idea which fits none of them, but which reflects all of them. So that is something which we need to be working towards. So when we are, so the lesson for all of us could be, I'm just saying, could be, you know, uh, that you know how we come at, uh, come come around with each other, how we try to create certain kind of you know knowledge traditions which are actually multidisciplinary in nature. So even when we are talking about something like poetry. We understand that uh, there is physics in it, when we are rotating the wheel, there is a lot of biology in it, How what kind of soil we are using, and there is a lot of art and aesthetics and a lot of mathematics into it, that how that entire thing is going. So the next time we go to a porter, we don't uh, try to look at him as somebody who is going to sell us something uh, formed with, uh, manufactured with clay, uh, but we see uh, this person as somebody who has internalized a multicultural, a, a multidisciplinary approach while, you know, preparing that particular um, 
product that we go and we buy. So appreciating that thing which has not been identified is something which is a challenge for all of us. Probably in when we're talking about a multidisciplinary approach, we don't again we don't have to think about uh, the new ideas. We have to observe around us and we'll have to figure out that what is that, you know, which engages more than one discipline. So locating our own disciplinary understanding into something which is around us and then trying to say that, oh, this context, this event, this scenario cannot be explained alone through my discipline, but it requires another discipline for its discussion. I think that is, for me, a kind of a multidisciplinary approach, which is not a pathway that we are trying to create, but this is a thought that we are trying to create. So identifying those junctures uh, and then, you know, taking that entire projection effect is another point which is important for us. And uh, it is giving us those kind of opportunities you know, when we are working on it. I'll just give you a very uh, short example for this, you know, that um, I was, we, we were working in a group for uh, internet users and, you know, how children are getting uh, impacted by it and things like that. So this started before COVID, but in, during COVID, uh, you know, we became more uh, observant about the things that were happening around us. Uh, um, so we constructed a project in which we have had one professor from... Um, uh, aims because this is something which is talking about the mental health of the children also and of course all the users. Our focus, our focus was on young adults at that time for the college core students because they were using a lot of it and there were a lot of incidents which were reported even with the children when they were using uh, the online resources for education. But before that we were more focused upon uh, you know the 18 plus group, 18 to 25 group and so um, I was there from education and we had a professor from IIT who was uh, you know looking into the technology part of it. So this was an event that was observed you know that if there is a kind of an internet kind of an issue that the uses of internet, how they're impacting the mental health of the people, what is the educational aspect involved in it and what is the technology involved in it, how can we come up with certain kind of thing. So we observed an event and that event was then studied from a kind of a perspective that we thought were critical to understand that entire event or to explain that event uh, and then of course to bring about a change because what is what do we what kind of guidelines do we need to add in education? What kind of uh, uh, mental health issues are to be addressed? How you know the addiction, internet addiction needs to be dealt with uh, by somebody in behavioral sciences and then of course what the technology can do uh, to make people more adaptive. Although they will not agree with us, they are totally a market, you know, and they want to make profit out of all our addictions, uh, especially the uh, this fresh one which is coming up over here. <coughs> the next point which I want to uh, you know, bring forth is um, the value of work. Gandhi's basic idea of education had a lot of emphasis on skill training. He always said that, you know, and you know, I remember I, when I was, it, it, it's really, really, really um, kind of on a, a time in history, um, 82 to 84 when I finished my, well, time when I was uh, going through my grade 10th, 9th, uh, uh, upper uh, secondary um, education is what we're talking about. We used to have something like SUPW, socially useful productive work. And I think all, everybody in my generation who are born in the uh, 60s and 70s uh, will remember having that kind of a, a, a subject in their school where they used to do that. And this is exactly driven from the Gandhi's philosophy where he said that, you know, uh, the intellect, the brain cannot work without hands being trained and to, to, to work properly. You know. So that he, he spoke about a lot about the psychomotor connections. He spoke a lot about how the various facilities have to be connected and how the person has to be seen as a whole and not only as a brain or as hands or as leg, you know, separated entity of the people. I think that was a very important point which we had at that uh, moment. Uh, gradually, people thought that as a was not serving uh, education, it took a very intense view post-liberalization uh, in the early 90s and people started talking about that probably for some hand kind of a work, you know, manual work, we can have somebody so SUPW lost its relevance at that point of time. And it was discontinued later in the school curriculum. Um, we had, a, in, even in, in CI, you know, when I was a student uh, of education, 
uh, we used to have work experience and I have very fond memories of doing metal work over there. How the metal ceremony used to be cut and then how we used to make designs on it. And there was an entire uh, set up for us at that point of time uh, where we were doing that. So I think, I don't know, but we have discontinued it at uh, CI also, at the Central Institute of Education, Delhi University, the Department of Education. We have discontinued it there also because somehow the teacher training is always connected with, uh, you know, uh, with the school practices and we are always influencing each other um, in bad or good ways. Uh, this was a bad way of influencing each other. Uh, so this happened here. Uh, I think that focus uh, is brought back in in this document when we're talking about the skill training, when we're talking about vocationalization. It is not exactly reflecting the same way as SPW was conceptually. It is planned a little differently, but the policy gives a lot of emphasis on hands-on training. It says a lot of things about how one has to move from content to competence. And for me, for somebody who is engaged with the pedagogy uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a focus or as a concentration area, I think this is very important for me to understand something that I have been very emphatically propagating all my life experience, uh, all through my work experience. Uh, that, you know, one subject is just a means of doing it, but finally we should focus on the kind of competence that the subject is trying to build upon. So this focus was individualized earlier. For example, if I believe in it, I will do it. A couple of more friends or colleagues believe in it, they will do it. That could be in India, across India, that's not an issue. But people who personally realized the importance of a subject beyond the content were doing it at personal level, whether they were teacher educators or school teachers or parents or anybody else, any, any anyone else. Uh, uh, in the in the immediate social environment of the uh, of the people who are being educated, I think that is one point which has been brought back. We are now not trying to say that you study science or you study social science uh, just because you should know the content of it. So this movement from content to competence, my affiliation with a little bit of task in study also is telling us that the there has been a movement from content to competence type of path, and that is how we are. To, you know, look at and place that entire argument. So a person needs to be, and, and another important dimension of it is that it plays a lot of emphasis on core values. That if, uh, because I was working with science group and physics group, so what the core value which physics can bring on to, uh, uh, children when they study uh, physics, you know. So those kind of conversations have, are happening and we're trying to put them on paper and we're trying to take all these things ahead and we're going to be working on all these ideas. So very interestingly, uh, you know, education is being seen as a process of unfolding the potential of individuals. I'm constantly using the word individual because uh, the, uh, the, the planning of education uh, based on the policy is not limited only to the school, but it has gone to higher education and it has also gone to uh, adult education. So uh, earlier, uh, whatever policies we have had, whichever policies we have had, they were focusing about grade one to grade 12, that was the focus. But now this policy has added these two primary dimensions. Extension, one uh, I mean, uh, higher education is something which is extended in the same talk. But two critical dimensions which are added as part of uh, uh, planning for education ECC, the early childhood care and education, and uh, the adult education, they are also becoming as one of the paramount uh, you know, uh, point discussions in the entire policy implementation idea. And this, I think, is important, you know, because if I want to bring any change, if I think of any change uh, with my children, you know, the, the, the 6 to 14 age, age group or the 6 to 18 age group, I have to understand that I don't want these children to get into conflict with their surroundings. We are not trying to create people who will get into uh, conflict with their surroundings, who will not be, who will lose the roots and who will use the ground of that at that particular moment. But we are trying to have somebody, the policy or the, any kind of, you know, organized effort should try to be, bring a kind of a harmony and cohesiveness in society. So with harmony and cohesiveness is one of the ideas being implemented. I think this is important for us to understand that 
uh, education has to span across the entire age uh, group. So all the people who are there, if there, uh, as we always say that the models are not fixed, the values are ever evolving. These ever evolving values need to have a discussion across all age groups, and that is something which is. Uh, which is there, which is being addressed, or which is being looked up by uh, by placing adult education as one of the critical aspect of educational planning in the entire document that uh, that is being spoken about. And there's again, we we'll see that there's a kind of a parity between both the ideas, the Gandhian idea, Gandhi as an idea, and you know NEP as an idea that I started uh, talking about. So understanding and appreciating that multi-layeredness in entire conversation is something which is extremely important uh, from my point of view. Uh, you know, uh, uh, getting onto the thinner layers of everything, even if something is very thin, there is a kind of discussion about that even the thinness has further layering, you know, and we got to be addressing it to that core of it. Uh, that is something which needs to be seen and which needs to be taken care of. Uh, I thought that uh, these are my, you know, these are my thoughts on uh, on the policy. But at the same time, I also, as a practitioner, I see a lot of challenges when it comes to implementation. So, when we're talking about a vision document, I think the vision document has certain very distinguished point of views, and you know, so that is why you know, putting Gandhi and NEP alongside is making a lot of sense for us because uh, this is how the entire argument is placed in both the philosophies. But at the same time, you know, sitting in 2022, we got to also understand that we are in a place uh, where our um, where our local context and our global context, the entire idea that the policy is trying to address from local to global, I think there is going to be a lot of challenge when it comes to implementation. There are multiple ways of looking at it. Now I'm going to speak totally as an as a person who is trying to understand the challenges of implementation from a very specific point of view of diversity and inclusion. So I'm not trying to uh, kind of try to understand that how the economics of it will be said. That is not something which bothers me. It bothers me, but not as a discourse, but as a human, it bothers me. But at the same time, what are my some of the very critical points with regard to inclusion and diversity, something which I want to share with all of us and probably we will have certain some time to have discussions with each other after that. So one of the important points which I have been trying to understand Um, so there's an opportunity. There are going to be special education zones. There are going to be there's going to be funding, which is which we are calling as gender funding. Uh, there is going to be inclusion of transgenders in the entire uh, realm of uh, work and education. There's a lot of emphasis on that. Um, and you know the court directive, the Supreme Court directive on disability and people and transgender people, I think, has made it compulsory for everybody to add those dimensions. Just just, just the you know tip of the iceberg. Uh, which I'm trying to say. Uh, so when we're talking about these kind of inclusions, uh, we also need to understand that one point we're talking about the inclusion from uh, all kind of diversity, whichever, whatever be the diversity, we're trying to talk about the inclusion. But at the same time, a lot of suggestions which are given through the policy will be left uh, will be decided by the stakeholders, and stakeholders means that the people who are studying, the students, and their immediate family people. It is easy for us to say that if somebody doesn't have a money to, you know, to complete entire three years of education in college, this person can exit after one year, uh, he or she can earn, and then you know they can come back to us second year, or third year, things like that. But we need to be very critically thinking about the outcomes. These are not, this is not, this is just proposed in the policy, but this is one of the outcomes over here. We need to be very critically understand, uh, reflecting upon this, you know, that um, are people prepared? Do people have that kind of cultural, culture capital, cultural capital to take these kind of decisions and what is good for them? So when it comes to you know providing flexibility, are we also providing the wisdom to the people that they are able to take reasonable decisions when the flexibility is being um, you know when the excess of flexible system is something that we need to be looking after. 
Um, I, I have a lot of research scholars in MPhil and PhD who are women. I know the kind of contestation that we, the women goes through. So, you know, certain ideas like uh, making it eight years for women, uh, it's a problem for me. I, I, I don't have enough time to explain why it is a problem for me, but it is somewhere telling the women that your career can wait, but a men's career cannot wait. I'm not trying to say that I'm trying to be very radical feminist over here, but I'm just trying to post that when we are making certain provisions in the name of inclusion, we should talk about provisions. We should not talk about conversations. So these two ideas which I have spoken about, these two kind of, you know, plugins which I have spoken about, the uh, multiple entities at higher education and, uh, you know, women getting more time to complete education, they are just examples of a large issue that I'm trying to raise, and that is, by first I'm trying to raise the issue that are people prepared to take those decisions? Have, do they have that kind of a wisdom that they decide what is good, what is not so good for them? That is point one which I'm trying to raise. The second point which I'm trying to raise is that when we are providing certain kind of uh, flexibilities, are we sure that we are trying to provide uh, providing concessions? Is that the way we should look at education at any point to be? Or should we look at education as something which provides or which creates provisions and not provide concessions? So when we're talking about inclusion, inclusion should be based on provisions. And provisions should be non-discriminatory. This is the argument which I'm trying to propose. The moment we are trying to make a discriminatory kind of a thing, uh, I think this is going to be um, uh, this is going to be a challenge again for us. To, for example, I add another example to it. You know, uh, a lot of people in my own um, in my own knowledge have started opting for uh, uh, for for open learning. That is our own uh, correspondence. Uh, there's a way we do the graduation through online mode. I mean, not sorry, not online mode, but through distance learning mode. Now, there are two types of people in this. One type of people are um, who understand that they need a graduation degree, but they are very critically employed or they are engaged with doing any other course which is a professional course which is going to be useful for them. So I'm talking about people who are taking a B or BCom from SON and then they are doing uh, preparing for CA and things like that because what I'm quoting at this moment is much before uh, the time of uh, the dual degree which has been in our course, uh, which is going to be implemented in time to come now. So there are a kind of flexibility where uh, people can choose to do two things simultaneously. They opted for it and they go, they went ahead and that. I'm working with one of the groups in Bangalore wherein a lot of people are promoting homeschooling for their own children. Now, these are the people who have opted for NIUS as a place of certification, and then they're going ahead and they're doing it uh, through NIUS. And they're doing it for the last 10 years. It's not something which is emerging up now. But there are, at the same time, there are other children or students, or there are other youth, you know, in college, which are. Uh, proceeding or who are going to an open system because they don't know what to do from um, otherwise, you know, they don't get entry, they don't have marks or whatever be the reasons, they are working somewhere in some kind of uh, basic jobs or something like that. There can be multiple reasons for why these children or why this youth is not in regular colleges. Um, I don't want to contest that again, but what I'm trying to say is that in time to come, this kind of a diversity will increase in our courses. This kind of a diversity will be there where people are coming with different objectives in their life. So when, when the students in our, in our classroom will come with different objectives in their lives, are we as teachers prepared to address that? Or are we, do we have the same vision in our mind that everybody who comes to my class is going to be, has to love my discipline. My discipline is the only way uh, to change their life experiences or things like that. So I think as teachers, we need to be working a lot on our own belief system when we will have, you know, I was asking a group of youth because there was some uh, men were on transgender uh, uh, being worked upon in, um, um, in certain places, um, in CRT precisely. So I was just asking them, like, how would you respond to a situation when you will have transgender children in your school or in your college. And trust me, nobody had a ready answer for it. 
and I'm not talking about children alone. I'm also talking about adults who are going to be dealing with it. So diversity, encouraging diversity to be there is something which is significant, which is important. But at the same time, we got to be under, we got to understand this that as teacher, as practitioners, our pedagogies, our belief systems, our social responses would also we need to maneuver, we need to work upon them, and we need to become more reflective as educators when we move on to the classroom. We have faced these kind of uh, uh, these kind of challenges, and I'm talking about it more for public universities, not for private universities, because in public universities, are even in higher education, our classroom configurations are extremely diverse. So we have worked upon this, we have faced those challenges, but these diversities are going to multiply in time to come. And that is uh, something which even we who are familiar with diverse uh, profiles of students in our classroom got to be working more critically and more reflectively on this entire practice of my own pedagogies, my belief system. Um, what I say in casual comments uh, to my people in the staff room, uh, to the other students, uh, all this reflects my belief system. So I, might, I might be saying that I'm a very inclusive person, but at the same time I realize that, you know, um, I tend to have a very deep-rooted uh, kind of a stigma or preference. It could be either ways, uh, which reflects in my behavior and some casual moment or things like that. So, belief system means that we are ready to be reflecting upon all those uh, casualties that may happen. We acknowledge that, uh, yeah, I committed a mistake. I should not have thought about it. So, you know, um, it may be a public acknowledgement if we have made a mistake in public, but it may be a self confession uh, to us that we need to be thinking beyond uh, what we are thinking. Uh, we all have a limitation. We have a lot of limitations that we are not trained, we are not socialized to think in a very inclusive way. So this, this is what I meant when I said some 20 minutes ago that the values are ever evolving, the context is ever evolving. And because the values and context are ever evolving, we as teachers, as practitioners in education have the first responsibility to evolve as more inclusive beings. As somebody who acknowledges that people are going to be diverse, they will come to us with different aspirations, they will come to us with different levels of expertise, and all of them will not know my subject, even if all of them may have a 95% score in their CSC, um, you know, exam or something like that. Or maybe they come from the same CUX uh, now the score, you know. But still, they are not same people. So understanding that diversity of ability, their cultural context, their social context, and how we evolve as teacher educators is something which is uh, which is. Um, which is a challenge to us. Um, at least I identify that as a challenge. And I also identified that as a personal challenge uh, for all of us, but at the same time, as the institutional ethos, that how an institutional ethos will evolve to move from content to competencies, more inclusive, uh, give that social space uh, to all the ideas, you know, because for me, people are ideas. On the ideas which, which people bring in from different context, I think that's the primary challenge for all of us. So I want to conclude by saying that it's, it's great that we have thought about this kind of a, a discussion, but at the same time, we also need to understand that uh, there is going to be something which is uh, for all of us to take home and, and you know, we work in that particular area. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And if there's time, I would really like to have one or two observations on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I, on behalf of uh, everybody in the hall, I thank you, ma'am, for your inv invaluable insights on the intertwining concepts of Gandhian philosophy and NEP. Your idea of respecting the nuances of diversity and encouraging inclusivity, at the same time providing flexibility, will definitely carve out a new path in education. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so Give much. A round of applause for ma'am, please. Thank you, everyone. Welcome our next eminent speaker in a minute. Uh, any questions from the audience if we can have? All right. Any questions from the audience?
Any observations? We're just getting a mic, ma'am. Just a second. Hello. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vandana, for your session. Uh, I see that you have uh, drawn a lot of similarities between uh, the concept of uh, the uh, Gandhian concept of education and uh, the national education policy. Broadly, if we had to say, we can say that uh, both uh, the idea of Gandhian idea and the NEP is trying to say that objective of, uh, objective of education is a holistic education. Uh, uh, if I have to break that down, perhaps uh, intellectual, <coughs> spiritual, and physical. Uh, my question is uh, specifically, do you see that there is a conflict between the objective of these two ideas? Uh, perhaps let's say that education is not only about uh, getting disciplinary spe uh, specific skills and then going to the market, but beyond that, uh, it has psychic gains or non-monetary gains. Uh, do you see the conflict between these two uh, objectives of these two ideas and the uh, objective of let's say private higher education, or perhaps higher, uh, higher education itself also, which, which primarily focuses on, you know, you get the discipline specific knowledge and you go to the market, you get a job. So do you see a conflict between the objective of these two ideas that you shared and the objective of uh, the higher education, Indian higher education, or more specifically, private higher education? <laughs> Thank you for the question. I think that's one of the very interesting questions and one of the interesting dilemmas, you know, that uh, we got to be facing. So, you know, when we start from this idea of education as a whole, edu holistic education, wherein after, you have uh, come up with three dimensions of it, spiritual, intellectual, and physical, you know, when we are looking at it like that, I think there are, uh, there is going to be, a, that is exactly what my critique was in the second part of it, you know, that there are going to be people who understand that education is to be seen in these three places. So all the three aspects are equally important. There are going to be organizations which will understand this. There are going to be uh, people, you know, the students and their families which will understand this. That, okay, there has to be a kind of a coherence between all three and all three are equally important. But at the same time, you know, we as people are not trained to understand that everything is 33% important. I'm just kind of, you know, making it look more very uh, quantized in that format, you know. So this is one thing where people have to be educated and that is my issue with the entire idea uh, which of implementing this particular vision uh, to, to uh, you know, to take it ahead, you know. But how shall we respond? How shall we make people, res people are allowed to take decisions? Systems are flexible, but do I, am I trained to take a decision? That is one of the very uh, basic issues that we will need to address, you know, because those people, again, you know, people with a higher cultural uh, capital will make more appropriate decisions as compared to those who are not trained. So will the policy actually cover the divide? Will the uh, policy actually address the gap with, between the has and have not? That is a very critical point for all of us to look into this. Second point is related to what I'm saying in the first point, you know, when we're talking about privatization of education, um, I'm sorry to say, you know, but I always say that this is a kind of a reservation for high economic uh, class, you know, because if you have the money, you can have access to quality education in that particular context. Of course, you need merit. I'm not trying to say that you may have 5% of marks in your CBSC and you go through that. But there is a possibility of getting quality education if one is financially well in that context. So I again say this, that you are absolutely right in saying I do see this contradiction, but I'm very, very, um, I'm very hopeful that all of us who are here, we are able, if we are able to locate this kind of a gap, this kind of a conflict in the two uh, prepositions, we should try to do something to come together and address this, probably provide some kind of bridge courses, do certain other kind of things, you know, that we're talking about, bring in more CSR to private 
private uh, organizations and you know give more uh, kind of you know um, subsidies or some kind of uh, grants or some kind of uh, scholarships to children who are students who are meritorious and who need quality education so these are the kind of things that we we'll have to work around and we'll talk about and i think uh, as a compilation Hello, of this conference can you hear me i'm just coming in yeah Hello. Did I... Hello. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, we have been joined by our next speaker. Uh, that's the voice you're hearing. You can carry on if you'd like to continue, ma'am. No, no, I responded to the question, I think, because it's a okay. large debate. And the gentleman and I can meet over a cup of coffee and take well, it. Let's uh, see if it works. <laughs> yes, ma'am. In the respective worlds, I think. I think I'm now. unmuted. But Do it we says have we will start in two minutes. Ma'am, we have another question from the audience for you. Yes. Now, it's in a tiny little thing, but I do see. So hopefully you're okay. First, I kept trying to say no one's letting you in. So Ma'am, I'm uh, uh, we'll, I think we'll I be sending your questions over the email. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. I, I hope it was physically possible. But we'll be sending across a memento and a token of our appreciation to you. And thank you so much for joining us, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you. All right. To introduce and welcome our next eminent speaker, I welcome Professor Amit Suman, please. Okay. I'll say it when I believe it. I'll believe it when I see it. Unmute. Hi, Professor Evan. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, oh terrific. terrific. Great. Uh, we are extremely sorry for the trouble you had and also you've woken up since 4 o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was uh, very very difficult. difficult, yeah. We are extremely sorry. But, but uh, I know you love well, me and I always keep you disturbing again, time and again. And this is, I think, for the, for the third occasion, I have invited you to India to, to share your views on Gandhi. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. you. So before we start, uh, I would like to request Professor Dinesh Singh. He is the former Vice Chancellor of University of Delhi to, uh, to welcome Professor Anand on behalf of SGT University and all of us present here. And yeah. Professor Allen, uh, you would be happy to know that uh, this is, I think, 6.30 in the evening in India, and almost uh, more than 100 people are uh, going to hear you and, and uh, would love to, uh, to, to listen to your lecture. So I'm welcoming Professor Thank you. to give a formal welcome to you. Professor Allen, it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce you today to the audience. I would like the audience to understand what a privilege it is to be in the august presence of Professor Allen. He is a philosopher who is always in action. For all his endeavors, society has accorded him special status. He's a distinguished, he has been recognized as a distinguished professor at Maine. He's also set up the Maine Peace Action Committee. This is 
knowledge in action and professor allen the mimansa school of philosophy the ancient mimansa school of philosophy in india repeatedly says knowledge without action is meaningless professor allen embodies that he personifies that and i want you to understand this it is meaningless to sit in a classroom and imbibe something in a lecture and not do anything about it i am reminded of the great french philosopher andre malraux who is very much in the mold of professor allen or let me say professor allen is very much in the mold of professor manro andre malraux without much ado i give to you ladies and gentlemen professor allen let's welcome him with a round of applause Um, thank you uh, for your kind words. Um, I uh, was delighted uh, when Professor Amit Suman from Karori Mal College of the University of Delhi uh, invited me to deliver the keynote address and has been my major contact as he was uh, for some wonderful programs during Gandhi 150. Uh, the, I wonder if there's some background sound where I can hear other people speaking. Uh, I wonder if they could be muted, if that's possible. The, um, so, the uh i also uh in addition primarily to thanking professor amitshuman uh i want to also thank the sgt university which although i've lived for many years in india i had never heard of uh the sgt university and now i realize that it's a quite new university which has done very impressive work in uh recent years and also i'd like to um acknowledge and thank uh, the san rachna foundation which is a uh, events think tank tank that does very good work and i'd also like to thank the provost madan chat uh uh chatavardi vedi um and others who um helped to sponsor and organize this impressive international conference on Gandhi's concept of education and uh national education policy NEP 2020 idea opportunity and implementation so for my invited keynote i gave the very dramatic title that uh i think is in your program uh gandhi's revolutionary critique of our dominant educational philosophy and practices as immoral violent and untruthful and his radical educational alternatives so i hope that uh my keynote will challenge and uh and uh will encourage um engage dialogue and there'll be time for questions disagreements and ongoing dialogue so gandhi is best known he's the best known he's the most widely admired of course indian in india modern indian but also i would say throughout the world but gandhi of course was also very controversial during his lifetime and this continues today so uh there's considerable confusion contradictory interpretations um contradictory applications uh in formulating uh gandhi's philosophy and his views of education uh i thought i would just give um five very briefly five qualifications each of which could be a topic for 
a major, uh, a major lecture. And then I'll focus on three major topics. Uh, first, uh, the need to be selective. Uh, as you know, Gandhi never wrote a long book. In fact, his most substantial book is probably Hin Swaraj, that he scribbled on a boat on the way back uh, from England to Durban, South Africa. And at most, it's 90 very small pages. And yet, Gandhi was one of the most prolific writers ever. Uh, as you know, for example, the 100 volumes of the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi contain uh, so many um, articles, interviews, uh, newspaper writings, and, and more. And in addition, of course, there's a huge secondary literature of people who have attempted to interpret, endorse, uh, refute Gandhi. So in presenting my topic, I necessarily need to be very selective. Secondly, um, Gandhi's philosophy and practices are holistic, organic, upholding the basic unity and interconnectedness of all of life, truth, and reality. Therefore, I could start with any of Gandhi's key values, principles, and concepts, such as violence and nonviolence, ahimsa, truth, satya, morality, swaraj, satyagraha, sarvodhya, swadeshi, the constructive program. And then I could analyze how they are all interconnected and how they all incorporate Gandhi's philosophy and concept of education. Third, uh, I'll just mention <coughs> um, the focus on text, context, and interpretations of Gandhi's view of education. And so, and there's this dynamic relationship, say, in Gandhi's lifetime between texts, what texts he read, and what texts he authored. The context with changing context within which Gandhi lived. Uh, and that shaped his experience and expressions and Gandhi's interpretations, and the interpretations of others of Gandhi and Gandhi's view of education during his lifetime. And today, of course, we are challenged with text, context, and interpretations, how in terms of our own contextual situatedness, how do we read Gandhi today? in selective ways, what is significant, what is ignored, what are the contexts with, through which we are filtering our understanding of Gandhi, many contexts of which are very different from what existed during, during Gandhi's lifetimes. And in fact, how do we interpret Gandhi's significance in open-ended, dynamic, contextually relevant ways that both draw on what's insightful in Gandhi, but also in terms of our new contextual creativity. Fourth, I could emphasize the primacy of practice. Gandhi is not interested in abstract concepts or theories of education. And he's often misinterpreted in this kind of essentialist way that he gives us the one true view of education, nonviolence, truth, morality, and more, or in an essentialized way, the critics will simply uh, abstract and totally reject Gandhi's view of education as completely irrelevant for education today. So what I, in my approach, there is not one absolutely true view 
of Gandhi, of Gandhi's concepts, and uh, of Gandhi's views of education. So uh, instead, we're engaged in a kind of contestation, dialogue, in which uh, we are, uh, in an open-ended way, we are trying to reimagine, reconstruct what is relevant, and we can learn from Gandhi in new contextualized ways. Finally, let me mention just a fifth qualification. Gandhi is, mis I, I think, misleadingly simplistic. When you read some of Gandhi, it's almost embarrassing if you take it at face value, some of what he says about education and so much more. In my work, what I found out is that this is misleading. Gandhi, even when Gandhi talks about simple life as high life, living with simplicity is actually very difficult. It involves self-discipline, self-purification. It, uh, it's a very nuanced, uh, it involves all kinds of difficult, contradictory, contextualized situations. So, uh, I, this I want to emphasize that in the approach that I'm taking, there are no simple answers in terms of my topic and Gandhi's view of education. Okay, now the three main topics that I want to emphasize are first, uh, uh, work I've done on Gandhi on education and on peace education. So to me, what is very instructive is that um, I wrote an article that was published in the journal Philosophy East and West about 15 years ago. And the title of my article was Mahatma Gandhi on Violence and Peace Education. It gradually dawned on me that for Gandhi, peace education is synonymous with education. In other words, in a way, the adjective peace before peace education could be eliminated. Now, using the more common term peace education has advantages of emphasizing key aspects of Gandhi's philosophy, but it also has disadvantages of miscommunicating that this is something one does in peace studies courses, something that one does through conflict resolution workshops or through specific, special, supplemental additions to the educational curriculum and process. By focusing on education, I want to emphasize that in Gandhi's philosophy, institutions that do not have peace education as their central mission are not proper educational institutions. Students who have not been educated to embrace peace education are in the full and deepest sense uneducated and are educational failures. Gandhi wrote extensively about education. His writings include hundreds of pages of critiques of the evils and deficiencies of British and other modern educational models and his proposals for positive alternative approaches. Throughout his adult life, Gandhi was involved in innovative and sometimes controversial educational experiences. And he learned from their successes and failures his specific formulations can be found in numerous articles, pamphlets, and reflections finally led to his Warda scheme of education, 
formulated at the educational conference held on 22-23 October 1937 in Wardell. And this became known as NITALIM, or in capital letters, New Education of Gandhi. The most emphasized part of this new education is Gandhi's, in capital letters, basic education that focuses on eight years of elementary education. New education is an essential component of Gandhi's famous constructive program that presents the positive moral and spiritual vision for a new independent India. Gandhi offers many valuable insights about education. Educators can benefit greatly by studying the formulations of the true goal of value education as liberation, providing means for service to meet the needs of others, for liberation from all forms of servitude and domination, and for one's ethical and spiritual liberation. Gandhi presents challenging, insightful formulations of basic and new education with regard to character building as the goal of education. One of Gandhi's famous seven social sins is knowledge without character, as education without character. Gandhi is a moral idealist, and his reflections on education do not emphasize only intellectual development, but rather the primary, the primacy and goal of completely developed human beings as moral beings. In various formulations, Gandhiji presents the goal of education as character building that focuses on the development of courage, strength, fearlessness, virtue, and the ability to engage in selfless work directed at moral and spiritual aims. He emphasizes the centrality of work, vocational training, and productive manual labor, the focus on real needs and simple living, the development of nonviolent relations, greater emphasis on moral development than unusual intellectual development, and a holistic approach that involves the integrated training of body, mind, and spirit. In terms of contemporary fragmentation and alienation, the following Gandhi formulation of his holistic integrative approach may be instructive. This is a quote from Gandhi. I hold the true education of the intellect can only come through a proper exercise and training of the bodily organs. For example, hands, feet, eyes, ears, nose, etc. In other words, an intelligent use of the bodily organs in a child provides the best and quickest way of developing his intellect. But unless the development of mind and body goes hand in hand with a corresponding awakening of the soul, the former alone would prove to be poor, lopsided affair. By spiritual training, I mean education of the heart, a proper and all-around development of the mind. Therefore, it can take place only when it proceeds on equal footing, hand in hand, with education of the physical and spiritual, spiritual faculties of the child. They constitute an indivisible whole. According to this theory, therefore, it would be a gross fallacy to suppose that they could be developed piecemeal or independently of one another. Many of Gandhi's specific educational proposals are valuable, but others, in my view, seem very idiosyncratic, provisional, outdated, and in need of radical revision or complete rejection. These may be valued. 
These may be valuable insights as well as serious weaknesses. In, for example, Gandhi's specific formulations about the need for local mother tongue and medical instruction, the limited and usually negative role of technology, the centrality of crafts in the educational process, the focus of education in reviving village life, and limited state support for universities and for higher education. In many cases, Gandhi's specific educational views were clearly directed at his specific Indian context and consistent with his dynamic, open-ended, pragmatic approach. He would have revised his views in terms of contemporary developments. In any case, such specific writings by Gandhi on education are not my focus. I, I shall instead focus on what I consider Gandhi's major contribution to education by examining his larger philosophical orientation and framework. It is within the larger philosophical, ethical, and spiritual orientation grounded in such concepts as nonviolence and truth that we can best comprehend what is the lasting value in Gandhi's approach to education today. So my second um, major topic is on Gandhi as a catalyst for rethinking our dominant narratives and alternative Gandhi-informed narratives of violence and violent education. So let me just uh, rather briefly indicate in my work uh, the need uh, to, uh, to interpret Gandhi as broadening and deepening our normal views of violence, nonviolence, and violent education. Okay, so let me um, just mention most people today, I'm sure in India and in the United States with all of our violence, most people would say they are opposed to violence in education. They're opposed to, for example, violence. We've had all these recent examples of gun killings in schools and other institutions in the U.S. Uh, what most people mean when they say they're against violence, say in schools and education, is they restrict this to very narrow, overt examples of physical violence. In other words, they say, I'm against someone coming into school with a gun and shooting people. I'm against overt bullying, rape, uh, overt examples of sexism or racism uh, in the schools and so forth. Um, fine. Um, but what got and Gandhi also is against examples of overt physical violence, right? terrorism, assassinations, all kinds of exploitation, injustice, abuse on kind of an overt uh, physical basis. But for Gandhi, uh, for me, one of the greatest strengths of Gandhi in broadening and deepening our understanding of violence, including educational violence, is that such overt physical violence actually constitutes a small, a very small, important, but very small part, part of overall violence. And Gandhi challenges us. He says most of us who say we're against violence and uh, violence in education, we actually, um, ourselves to a very violent, and we support such violence either tacitly or directly. We often benefited from it, 
or can we avoid uh, having to deal with its basic root causes, structural relations? So we are part of the problem, not the solution. How can Gandhi say this? Gandhi says, in addition to overt physical violence, as seen in educational violence, violence is multidimensional, multidimensional. Gandhi focuses, for example, how we have inner violence, psychological violence, right? In which uh, we are full of hatred, for example, which is violence. People who are socialized in education uh, in ways that are ego-driven in very aggressive, hateful ways uh, in how they regard themselves and others are very violent people. In addition, Gandhi talks, he spends the most time on economic violence, it's multidimensional and how that affects education, schools, curriculum, opportunities, and so forth. So for Gandhi and educational violence, uh, he analyzes this in t as exploitation in terms of asymmetric hierarchical relationships between the economic haves and the economic have-nots. Right? And so for Gandhi, in his kind of egalitarian way, one, uh, if one is committed to nonviolence in education and all other forms of life, one must struggle against those hierarchical structures of power, of wealth, of privilege, of control, uh, that define so much of India today, the United States today and the world. Gandhi talks about cultural violence. He talks about uh, religious violence, right? Uh, that we see uh, all over the world and in India today. He talks about um, social violence, environmental violence, uh, environmental violence educational violence, and all of these different dimensions of violence uh, in terms of our education and educational institutions interact, right? Mutually reinforce each other, and, um, and in fact, uh, uh, define education today. And as I said, for ed Gandhi, education is not simply what is taking place in the classroom, but it defines, in fact, our total life in communities, uh, in families, in castes, in classes, genders, and in all other aspects of our life. So this, in fact, is part of for Gandhi how education forms all of life. In addition, Gandhi talks about the violence of the so-called normal status quo, business as usual, in which there is no active disruption, say in terms of our educational institution, no one is disrupting, no one is committing civil disobedience, no one is resisting, it looks peaceful and nonviolent. For Gandhi, the status quo, right, uh, is educationally, politically, socially, militarily, culturally, religiously, is inherently, relationally, structurally violent. And that's why for Gandhi in education, it's important to disrupt the so-called normal, violent, immoral, untruthful status quo. Okay. So when you put together uh, Gandhi's view of multidimensional status quo violence, including uh, violence in education, you can see how he broadens and deepens greatly our understanding of education. So let me, um, what I'm going to do is uh, just share a little that I prepared uh, in um, 
in uh, pointing to how he presents radical challenges and value as a catalyst. Uh, and uh, I, I thought simply because of probably participants here from colleges, universities, other institutions, I would just say some dramatic things in terms of my topic on uh, how Gandhi would say our typical settings today in higher education are very violent, okay? And at the same time, remember that Gandhi's primary emphasis is on the formative training and socialization of young children, uh, as you also have in the, um, uh, the National Education Policy, the NEP uh, 2020. Um, so what Gandhi is saying that most people do not think of universities and classrooms, classroom teachings as violent. But Gandhi argues that normal, normal university education is very violent, both in terms of multidimensional violence and the violence of the status quo. From Gandhi's perspective, the, quote, peaceful, unquote, seemingly nonviolent classroom can be very violent, even when there are no outbursts of violence. A professor, for example, may use the grade as a weapon to threaten, intimidate, terrorize, and control students, including those who raise legitimate concerns, questioning the analysis of the teacher with institutional power over their lives. A teacher may use language or even facial expressions and other body language Communication in a violent way, as when ignoring, humiliating, or ridiculing students who ask questions. Most often, such students will become silenced and will not subject themselves to the dangers of further terrifying humiliation. In more general terms, Gandhi would emphasize that universities in the early 21st century educate students and do research in violent ways. Modern universities have increasingly become commodified and corporatized. Education is a good investment. Commodified students as a means to some corporate end are our most important product. Through education, we increase their market-driven exchange value. Central Gandhian ethical, cultural, spiritual, social, and humanistic priorities regarding peace and nonviolence, love and compassion are usually ignored, occasionally attacked as, quote, unrealistic, and sometimes acknowledged, but then they go unf unfunded and they are marginalized. Gandhi would view many courses, departments, and colleges as violent, even if this is taken as the status quo in no need of justification. Economic and business courses assume a framework and orientation in which students are educated to calculate how to maximize their narrow, ego-defined self-interest and how to defeat opponents and win economically in a world of adversarial win-lose win relations. For Gandhi, we are miseducating our students to such dominant economic models in which economic success is synonymous with maximizing economic exploitation, and exploitation is always violent. Similarly, Gandhi's educational approach would analyze most political science or government courses as inherently violent, since they claim to be value-free but actually assume as an immutable given a status quo framework in which we live in a violent world of antagonistic adversarial relations. The goal is to win by amassing greater power 
and dominating those challenging one's power interests. Similarly, public relations and communications courses usually adopt a violent framework in which the goal is to use language, images, and media to manipulate and control other, others, to get one's way, and to maximize one's narrow interest in winning in a world of violent relations. In terms of his own professional background, Gandhi was a barrister, and he makes the same kinds of criticisms of adversarial, violent legal system in which the goal is not cooperation, reconciliation, and peaceful relations, but to exacerbate and exploit multidimensional violence and to win at any cost by defeating the other. To provide one other disciplinary illustration, Gottfried's approach to education points to the normal violence of the status quo reflected in most disciplines of the sciences, engineering, and technology. Scholars uncritically adopt math models of instrumental rationality in which they provide the means allowing for ends of control, domination, and exploitation of other human beings and of nature. Gandhi is not focusing on individual professors or students who are rewarded for acquiring and applying such scientific and technological means. His more fundamental and radical critique is of the unacknowledged systemic structural violence that defines such disciplines and that has devastating violent economic, military, political, and environmental effects on uh, most of humanity and Okay, because of uh, time, uh, I'm going to go quickly through, uh, try through my third major point so I can leave a sufficient time for questions and discussion. My third major point is Gandhi's long-term preventative approach in education. Okay. And to me, this is one of Gandhi's most valuable contributions on violence, nonviolence, and education. Uh, in Gandhi's preventative approach, there are short-term benefits. Gandhi, Gandhi has all kinds of means, techniques, values, and so on, in which you can diffuse, defuse immediate violent situations, say, in the classroom or in your community and anywhere in your life. And often he is very successful. For example, if you can control discipline your ego, if you do not strike back when someone is being violently, even verbally violent towards you, and you become trapped in endless karmic cycles of escalating violence, if you attempt to empathize, even when you disagree, empathize with what the other is experiencing, often this has a very positive effect. It kind of, uh, kind of diffuses the situation. It kind of disrupts the normal escalating uh, variables and connections, and it can often lead to very positive effects. So I could give many examples of this, and especially in terms of Gandhi's famous means-ends analysis, epistemologically, morally, socially, culturally, educationally, environmentally, also ontologically. Uh, but I'll simply indicate, for me, the greatest benefit that Gandhi has in terms of his preventative approach in education is in terms of long-term, long-term preventative efforts. And what Gandhi is saying is that um, we become entrapped in basic structural systems and relations in which we don't get to the basic root cause, basic determinants, 
And we take these short-term measures, Gandhian or otherwise, nonviolent or violent, that often, in fact, have limited effects. And we keep replicating the same overall conditions and situations that entrapped us. For Gandhi, you can't use terror to overcome terrorism, right? Uh, you can't, uh, Gandhi gives endless examples of this, where you cannot use extreme violence uh, in order to achieve nonviolence. You cannot maximize going to war in order to establish peace and so forth. So, um, what for me, this is Gandhi's greatest uh, contribution in terms of education, whether it's in the classroom and especially in all of life, how we become socialized from earliest childhood in a ways to increase our awareness of the basic systemic root causes that give rise to so much violence, immorality, untruth, and so forth, so that we can intervene, intervene we can, in fact, disrupt those uh, vicious cycles, endless cycles, to begin to introduce new values, new variants of love, of cooperation, of kindness, of self-sacrifice, of ego, of serving the needs of those who have the least freedom and the greatest need. And in fact, when we do that, that is how, in fact, we develop ourselves as, in fact, moral, truthful, spiritual uh, human beings. So I'll simply throw that out briefly. There are many other uh, topics I haven't raised and point on the absolute and the relative, which is so important to this topic. Let me just end uh, by saying that there are many difficulties and challenges uh, for me in Gandhi's philosophy of education, right? And uh, for me, uh, the best approach to Gandhi's philosophy of education is a dynamic, open-ended, contextualized approach in which we do not claim that Gandhi gives us some absolute perfect blueprint of true education that we can then simply impose on any of our context difficult contextual situations in which, in fact, we are dialectically engaged in which we are able to uh, appropriate what remains of lasting value in Gandhi, and then how we can reappropriate, reimagine, reconceptualize, and reapply what is of so insightful and of such great value in Gandhi's. Uh, concept and philosophy of education and integrate this with complementary non-Gandhian approaches that also today can contribute greatly to our understanding uh, and transformation of education in ways that lead to greater truth, to greater morality, to greater nonviolence, and I might add and to the possibility of sustainability economically and environmentally for this generation and the future. So thank you for uh, your careful uh, attentiveness. And I now I really welcome any questions, challenges, disagreements, anything you'd like to share. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for that very insightful talk on Gandhiji and his concept of education. I need to use that? Okay. Uh, so we do have a few questions here. Uh, if you are ready, we would actually request the delegates here to ask a few queries that they have. Okay. All right, sir. So.
Do you have a mic or something, sir? Professor Allen, it was uh, very yeah. inspiring. Uh, the views and ideas, what you presented on uh, Mahatma Gandhiji. I have uh, a small query. I mean, some so, hundred years before, <laughs> in the United States itself, there was a kind of crisis in secondary education. Now, during 1890s and 1900 or 1910s, in Chicago University, the laboratory schools came up through the pragmatist educationist John Dewey and his colleagues. Over a period of time, that laboratory schools have been converted into many forms of schools, and ultimately, they established uh, the teacher's college at Columbia University. And today also, Columbia University teacher's college is almost number one in the world. Now, comparing, com coming back to you know, Mahatma Gandhi's basic education, of course, uh, you pointed out much thing, but you were more on uh, ideological and philosophical expressions on particularly uh, education on non-violence. But uh, basic education is concerned. We are still uh, you know, lagging behind in our country. How can you compare that John Dewey's pragmatist education or uh, the ideas what it has been propagated for more than 120, 150 uh, years in the United States, which was widely spread in more than 50 countries in the world, and the basic education of uh, Gandhi and uh, our Indian you know, subcontinent, the idea which is spreading out now through national education policy, where the latest thing is what Professor uh, Dinesh Singh's uh, Cluster Innovation Center. Maybe over a period of time, this Cluster Innovation Center could be converted into a college and it can be widely spread throughout India. In what way you can take out to this? Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, should I, can I respond now? Yes, sir. Okay, so thank you uh, for your thoughtful question. Um, and clearly, uh, you know a lot about John Dewey. Uh, and so I also am a great admirer of John Dewey, and who, as you said, had great influence in the United States. Uh, and throughout the world, and I might say especially in China. Many of Dewey's students, in fact, were, were Chinese who went back and uh, uh, had a major influence in education for a while there. Now, in terms of comparing Dewey and Gandhi, which uh, uh, I would uh, say there are many comparisons. Uh, the, I emphasize with Gandhi the primacy of practice. And this is true of Dewey. Dewey was not concerned, like you said, with some abstract theory of education. He had his labs, his experiments. And for Dewey, what was important was how you apply education in, in a pragmatic way to make a difference. And, um, and so, uh, and uh, just as we associate Dewey with American pragmatism, right? Um, Gandhi, in my interpretation, Gandhi also is a pragmatist and concerned with the primacy of practice. A lot of people forget that for Gandhi in his experiments with truth, he focuses on our intentions, our will, purity of the will. But what people forget is that for Gandhi, if in fact one has the best of intentions 
and then engages in experiments with proof. And it has very bad consequences. For Gandhi, these are failed, failed experiments with truth. So, but Gandhi's pragmatism is quite different from Dewey's pragmatism. So it's important you can make comparisons, but also, for example, Gandhi has so much of a focus on Ahimsa, much more than Dewey has. This is central to Gandhi's philosophy and his philosophy of education. Um, I might say, which I didn't have come before, uh, Gandhi has absolute ideals of Ahimsa, right? He always intends that, but what people forget is when you apply this, what in you in education, you are in very complex situations. How do you respond to the person who has a gun and is shooting people? How do you respond to the person who is raping someone? And they're not interested in engaged dialogue and peaceful. How do you, uh, for example, I did a lot of work on the 2611 terrorism in Mumbai, right? How would Gandhi respond to the terrorists as they're killing people in the hotels, in the, you know, other places, protesting for the Mumbai? So people forget that. Although Gandhi has absolute values of nonviolence, Gandhi reluctantly, and Gandhi still 90% of the time were violent, there are nonviolent alternatives. But Gandhi does agree there are some situations where violence is allowed. People, Gandhi is often a shock when I tell them Gandhi even has writings that he entitles. When killing, killing is like So there are these tragic situations in education and throughout life where violence may be necessary uh, because it's the most nonviolent option that we have. But at the same time, we should never glorify violence. What we do is, when we're violent is not moral, it's tragic, it's a sign of human failure, and then we should do everything to bring about the basic educational, structural changes so that we don't keep replicating that same violence. Okay? So, but I agree the topic of Dewey and Gandhi is a very fruitful one. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Sir, do you have any follow-up question or anyone else who's curious and wants to ask a question from sir here? Any queries further or comments? Thank you so much, sir. That would be all from our end. Thank you for taking out the time and interacting with us, highlighting what nonviolence is as per Gandhiji and how he has employed it in the concepts of education. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us here. So, okay. So, the, uh, yeah, the, thank you. I was just going to say, um, I think that there are very uh, thoughtful uh, faculty and students who are in the audience. And so I would say, uh, can we just give one more minute to allow, because I know many people have good questions or comments. They may be just a little shy or reluctant. So I think maybe if we just give one more minute, we could get another good question. Sure, sir. And along with that, with your due permission, sir, if it is OK, we would like to share your email ID with the delegates here. If they have any queries sure. or they want to follow up on any of the discussion points, they'll get in touch with you directly. Yes, that, uh, I'd be delighted. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We do have one more question here, sir. Thank you, Professor Alan. Ah, good. Hello. Yes. 
Yeah, thank you for your insights uh, on violence in education. Uh, you talked about uh, our classrooms and university settings uh, being very violent in uh, their overall setup, if not physically, mentally, socially, and economically. That is what you said. Uh, yes. But if you, if you look at uh, society like India, uh, we have a lot of uh, social and economic inequalities that, are, that already persist. So yeah. we are actually bound to have those, if, if you're calling them as violence, we are bound to have uh, those violence in our classrooms. But I think same classrooms will uh, impart the peace education. And yeah. uh, if you look at, again, the uh, great Nobel laureate, uh, uh, Gary Becker, uh, from Chicago School of Economics, uh, he talks about, uh -huh. he talks about uh, peacefulness, he talks about morality, he also talks about uh, character building, and he says that these are, uh, these are uh, values or virtues that can be accumulated by habitually mm -hmm. practicing them. So I feel, yes. that, what do you think that, uh, uh, how do we accumulate, uh, as students, how do we accumulate peace education in classroom? Or as uh, professors mm -hmm. or as teachers, how do we impart peace education? Or because in a society like India, uh, social uh, uh, economic inequalities are bound to be there. So, uh, the violence that you're talking about, it, it, it is going to be there. Yes. Um, okay, well, Sophia, that of course gets to also a very fundamental question. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, piece, the way I tried to present it, and let me just say something Again, there was so much I could have said, but what that I've observed is going on in India, and actually all the time. I first came to India for a year, and I was very young in 1963, 1964. And I mainly did, taught, and I did PhD, postgraduate work, in probably the top department of Indian philosophy in India. Uh, the pr my mentor was the president of famous of the Indian Philosophical Congress. I studied mainly under the Vedantists, who were mainly Advaitins, followers of Shankara, Shankaracharya, and uh, I learned all these wonderful things. And what I realized there, but especially after I left India after a year, how uh, that situation was often very violent. And uh, in terms of um, class privilege, in terms of caste, in terms of how the uh, people in the department were treated, in terms of gender, we had people who were known as peons, peons, like that was their name, and the way the uh, rickshaw wallers and the other Harijans, the Dalits, the untouchables were treated, often physically, but always verbally and in different ways, was extremely violent. So what, and I might say, uh, in my experience, including my last sabbatical, where I was based at IIT Madras, living there on campus, and, um, and then also at IIT Bombay, where I uh, spent considerable time during my sabbatical, uh, there was tremendous violence. And a lot, and some of it increasingly is in the name of Gandhi. So the fact that people use the name, the image of Gandhi, for example, in the increasingly, a lot of the Hindutva people that I knew 20, 30 years ago, they would say, Gandhi is the enemy. Gandhi is a traitor. Gandhi is responsible for partition, for Kashmir. Gandhi favors Muslims. 
and other minorities. Gandhi is an enemy of the people. And some of them, they agreed with Nataram Gatsi, totally with his defense. Uh, now what I found is some of the same groups, individuals, parties, increasingly, say in the last five, ten years, they say Gandhi is a great Indian. So he's a great Hindu. And they use Gandhi uh, in a very aggressive, violent way, uh, in ways that totally contradict everything that I've said about Gandhi. So what I agree with you when we talk about peace in the classroom, the main thing, in fact, is the socioeconomic, hierarchical relations in the society that's part of education, and then, of course, that's reflected in the classroom. Uh, and that's why I tried to point out that if you simply restrict Gandhi on education to certain piece of education, things you can do in the classroom, which are important, they're, they're important, but they're very, very limited unless you, in fact, extend education to the greater society at large. And um, one last thing I'll mention, because it's such a good topic. You know, uh, Gandhi also, in the classroom, what happens at my university with peace studies, uh, conflict resolution, which are things I support and I've been involved in, but they're very limited. And we often say, ah, in the classroom or on the campus, we must have peace. And, uh, and peace is used in a very limited way. It simply means the absence of war, the absence of overt violence. But for Gandhi, that peace is not really peace. Gandhi, uh, similar to Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther King Jr., says what we call peace is usually what he calls a negative peace, which is no peace at all. You have no peace without justice. Without justice, there is no peace. So if we're dealing with real peace, we can't really simply say, or you need to have peace of mind. That's a very important peace of mind. I jog, I meditate, I do all these things, uh, try uh, to sometimes center you and bring more peace of mind. But in fact, if Gandhi, if you have peace of mind, when all around you there is injustice, hierarchy, exploitation, people suffering, people starving, unnecessarily, by humanly caused um, oppression and exploitation and domination. And if you're peaceful in that situation, Gandhi wants to disrupt your so-called peace because, in fact, you necessarily should be concerned. Their suffering is your suffering. And when you act to alleviate the suffering of others in need, that's how you develop as a spiritual, moral, truthful, meaningful, self-realized human being. So I agree totally with you that if we're dealing with the situation in India or anywhere, we do have to focus mainly in education on those basic social, economic, military, hierarchical, power, corporatized, uh, structures of domination, control, and exploitation. Uh, and if we don't, then in fact, our views of peace and education uh, will be limited. So thank you for raising some very, very important concerns. Thank you so much, sir. I believe NEP 2020 is a very determined step in towards uh, bringing in equity as well as equality in terms of 
education as well as peace education, if we can term it as that. So thank you so much, sir, for taking out the time and being with us, enlightening us. And I think lots of us amongst uh, all the delegates here will be getting in touch with you soon enough. Good. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All right, now I would move on and welcome Khushi, student of Delhi University, to come here and deliver a summary of the two-day international conference, Gandhi's Concepts of Education and National Education Policy 2020. Good evening, respected guests, faculty, and dear audience. Today, I, Khushi Kesri of Delhi University, on behalf of the organizing committee, SDT University, Sanarchna Foundation, and Shiksha Sanskriti Uthanyas, take this opportunity to conclude this wonderful two-day long event. No event is planned in a day, rather days and weeks, and a lot of hard work go into its preparation. What we saw over the past two days was the culmination of that hard work. Over the course of these two days, we not only heard eminent personalities and scholars, but also got a chance to interact with them. On 20th July, the event began with the lamp lighting ceremony and the Saraswati Vandana. The inaugural session was graced by Professor Dinesh Singh and Dr. Sachidanand Joshi, who shared their stories and views upon the theme of the event. A total of seven seminars took place over the course of the event. The first session of the event was on the theme Gandhi and the Historical Tradition. Professor Seema Bhava, Professor Anand Prakash, and Professor Santosh Rai shared their views. They deliberated upon various topics, such as how there has been an evolution in visual culture when it comes to Gandhi, how Gandhian approach to life can become an altering experience, and how there needs to be a change in the mindset of student and teacher alike. Colonel Partha Pratim Dube chaired the session and shared his ideas on education and Gandhi. The first session was followed by a session on the theme Cluster Education Innovation Experiments, Delhi University and FYUP 2013-14. Professor Madan Mohan Chaturvedi, Professor Shobha Bagai, and Professor Jyoti Sharma graced the session while Dr. Virendra Mishra chaired it. The session focused upon how cluster innovation education centers provide more flexibility and encourage the students to experiment and learn from those experiences. Professor Dinesh, sir, in his previous address, mentioned that the aim of education is not to cover the courses, rather discover them. CIC draws a lot from this idea and encourages students to start startup. Students from Delhi University shared their stories of their startups and encouraged the audience to think towards a more free-flowing learning environment. The third and the final session of the day was graced by Professor Jawaharlal Kaul and, Amok Dev, and Mr. Amok Dev Rai. They deliberated upon how Gandhi played a part of a larger vision as an innovator, economist, and a tool to turn the wheels of change. Professor Kaul explained that the aim of a good education is to make and produce a good human being. One needs to understand education needs to be in tune with the needs of the society. Professor Call correlated it with Gandhian education concept and showed how it does not remain stagnant, rather provides idea for innovation. All the guest speakers, moderators, and chairs were felicitated with mementos, certificates, and book. The first day concluded with a conference dinner. The second day of the event began with even more enthusiasm and zeal. Seldom we chance upon a conference where vice chancellors of renowned universities come together to deliberate and discuss upon various aspects of National Education Policy 2020 and the evolution in education system. This session was embarked upon by Sri Vinay Sahastrabuddhi, who put an emphasis on soft powers of a country and showed how they can help bring opportunities to the nation. He talked how we can enhance education and make India an education hub. Professor Umesh Rai from University of Jammu, Professor Bechin Lal from Cluster University Jammu, Professor C.V. Sharma, Ignu, and Professor O.P. Kalra, SGT University, discussed upon the changing face of education, how the teacher-taught relation needs to improve, how education in sync with Gandhian concept can bring about a change, 
and they all discussed how NAP can be the changing face of future education. The floor was then open for discussion and the audience asked questions and gave their comments on the discussion that just had. The session concluded with Dinesh sir felicitating the speakers. The second day of the event focused on Gandhi's concept of education, philosophy and religious ideas. Professor Prakash Narayan chaired the session and Professor Ritesh Singh, Professor Amit K. Suman and Professor Shalin Jain were the respected speakers. Professor Ritesh Singh highlighted upon Gandhi's life journey and philosophy, while Professor Amit K. Suman commented upon Gandhi's education ideas, which was inspired from indigenous knowledge systems of the country, emphasizing, putting an emphasis on, on self-sustainable village society, which forms the core crux of the NAP. Professor Shalin Jain talked about Gandhi's religious ideas and the Jain system of philosophy reflected in education. The third session of the day saw an interesting take upon science and education. Dr. B. Khamar chaired the session and Professor Sandhya Vasudevan moderated it. Professor Unnat P. Pandit, Professor Rakesh Pandey, Dr. Parikshit Manhas and Shri Sopan Joshi discussed upon the concept of proactive action, not compromising of quality and benchmark, def defining intel intellectual property and learning with open mind and adapting knowledge from various disciplines. They also touch upon Gandhi's relevance in other walks of life. It sparked an interesting debate among the panel. The session was concluded on with the felicitation of the speakers and the guest. The last session of the day, as well as of the event, saw two eminent speakers, Professor Vandana Saxena and Professor Douglas Allen, joined us online. Professor Vandana Saxena talked about Gandhian philosophy towards education and emphasized that more focus should be given on competence rather content. She also talked about social and economic diversity of India, which is reflected in NAP. Professor Douglas Allen explored the interpretations of Gandhian thoughts and the different dimensions of violence, highlighting its interaction and effect on education. The enlightening discussion concluded with expressing heartfelt thanks to the speakers. The second day thus concluded successfully, making the event an overall success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kushi, for setting the tone for the vote of thanks here. <laughs> So we've come to the concluding segment of the two-day international conference, Gandhi's Concept of Education and National Education Policy 2020. We witnessed intense deliberations that were thought-provoking and riveting. We got insights into the people who are the policy makers here. They came in, they shared their insights, their vision, what it is that is involved in 2020 NEP. So when we were listening to all these lived experiences, I think it, we were all extremely motivated. And we are actually ready to go and understand <laughs> at the same time, maybe uh, apply it as well, start applying it as well. So that is how we are going to look at it from today onwards. The two-day international conference, it was hosted by Sandrachna, SSNU, APN, and last but not the least, SGT University. <laughs> and on behalf of SGT University and Sandrachana Foundation, I, Arvinder Karpabla, would like to thank and express our gratitude towards Professor Dr. Dinesh Singh, Director Click, thank you so much, sir. Dr. Sachidanand Joshi, Member Secretary, IGNCA, Shri Vinay Sahasrabudhe, ICCR, NMP, Rajya Sabha, Shri Amog Dev Rai, Sanrachna Foundation, Dr. Amit Suman, Fellow of Royal History Society, Kishori Mal College, and of course, for coming in here, taking the time out, sharing their valuable thoughts here with all of us towards getting a better understanding of NEP 2020 and how Gandhiji's concepts they are associated and relevant till today and how they can be applied. Thank you so much, everyone. We thank all the galaxy of the stalwarts that are here, academia that has come in together here to listen in, deliberate, as well as contribute 
towards this particular conference. Galaxy of uh, stalwarts like vice chancellors, eminent dignitaries, as well as the SGT officials who have come in to make it meaningful for all of us. Warm gratitude to all the faculty deans, faculty members, delegates, students for their kind attention as well as their inputs. I would also like to take this particular opportunity to thank Faculty of Mass Communication, led by Professor Sushil Manav, Branding and Digital Team, led by Mr. Ms. Herman, teams from Finance, Horticulture, Transport, IT, Audiovisual Departments, Housekeeping Staff, the Catering Team, Catering Team specifically because they kept the <laughs> deliciousness of the event in place for all of us. And we cannot miss this opportunity to thank NMML for providing us this venue with specific mention to Mr. Rajiv Ranjan, who was there constantly supporting us throughout whole of this conference. All of this would not have been possible without the constant support and motivation of our very own chairperson, ma'am, Shripmati Madhupreet Kaur Chavla, managing trustee, Shri Manmohan Singh Chavla, we just cannot thank them enough. They are always constant support for all of us here. <clears throat> Conclusion of the event, again, will not be possible without mentioning the team who has toiled day in and day out to make this particular conference a success. And this is possible under the able guidance of the organizing chair, Professor Madan Mohan Chaturvedi ji, advisor, come provost, SGT University. Thank you, sir, for guiding us all throughout. <laughs> Director, External Affairs, Shri Rajneesh Vadwa ji. <laughs> Two days they went off seamlessly because of our Masters of Ceremony, Dr. Radhika Rai, as well as Dr. Reshu Sanan. Thank you to them. And now we come to the place where we are going to extend our gratitude to the organizing team here. Dr. Bharti, Miss Monica, Dr. Sonia, Dr. Ravi Tomar, Mr. Dinesh, Dr. Simranjit, Mr. Tushar, Mr. Manpreet Singh, Dr. Aditya Kapoor, personals from Sanrachana Foundation, these are the core members who have toiled hard to bring it to the fruition today. A bigger loud, uh, round of applause for the student coordinators. Student coordinators from DU, they were led by Khushi. Student coordinators from SGT University, they joined in and they gave a lot of time and attention to all the details that you're looking around here. And of course, in the end, I would say everyone who has been either directly or indirectly been associated with this particular conference. And uh, <laughs> in the end, this is actually uh, something that is not an end. It is uh, what we say a beginning of many